2020, The New Earth, an Experience Report by Jesus Erlauber, a.k.a. Bochy. Preface. I remember that day we spent at the beach. It was a really hot day. It was only two weeks ago, and in these two weeks, my life has changed considerably. At first, we didn't notice anything. Nathan was a bit quieter, but that wasn't unusual for him. He's a good observer and listener, and he doesn't talk nearly as much as I do. On the drive back, we could feel that something was on his mind, and when we got back home that evening and he started explaining, we were all taken aback. He told us a story that didn't leave anyone untouched. In the meantime, I'm in Vienna, and I'm writing this, Nathan's story, even though I'm still not sure what to think about it, and it's still occupying my thoughts, added to the fact that I am part of the story too. Nathan asked me to write it, but it's his. He would like to stay anonymous, and doesn't even have a Facebook account. He also uses the internet very cautiously. At the moment, we're talking over Skype almost daily to compare what I have written. Nothing will be released without his consent, and that it happened exactly as I have written it. As unbelievable as his story is, we all thought he was dreaming at the beach, there are very convincing aspects to it, considering it all happened in the half hour he was lying on the beach when we were swimming. I find this to be even more unrealistic than a dream, especially as he can recall so many memories. Could it really be true? Did my friend really time travel? I'm not so sure that it isn't possible to do anymore, but my mind just doesn't want to believe what Nathan told us. That's why I decided to write this book, because it's the only way to find out. It's going to be a long five years before we reach the point where we know for sure. By the way, the first two weeks have already proven some of his points to be valid. Two weeks ago, I would have laughed at anyone who told me that I would be in Vienna. It was completely unplanned, but in retrospect, fully explainable and understandable. I must admit that I'm excited and am writing the book with great expectation and growing joy. The details of the book expand a lot on what he explained the first evening, and until now it hasn't contradicted anything as I am finding out while writing it. I'm looking forward to the end result, and Nathan assures me it will be finished by the end of July 2015. One thing stays in my thoughts. Nathan, who was changed on that day, didn't need or want to bother anyone with this. The humorous seriousness in his eyes and the peace in him are definitely new and unusual. He has changed my world, and I am definitely not the same guy I was two weeks ago either. I wish every reader as much fun with the book as it is meant to bring. If the story is true or not, doesn't matter. I try to forget the question and look how it can inspire us. See you in 2020. Bauke. Jesus Urlaube. Quote, Think about how you look at the world because that's how you see it. End quote. To my esteemed readers, I welcome you on board Brain Lines. My name is E. Kensington and I am the captain. Please take a relaxed position and try to calm your thoughts. That way I can guarantee a safe journey from which we may not return. The plot of the story that follows and all the people in it are not imagined. Any similarity to living or real people isn't by chance. If something awakens your interest, it might be useful to do your own research on the internet. Nevertheless, it is all fiction. Nevertheless, it is all real. B.
before you start to read, allow your mind to be freed. About the risks and side effects, forget what your doctor or pharmacist would say. Make your own experiences. I wish you all a pleasant journey to the year 2020, the new Earth, an experience report. It's July in one of the hottest summers we've ever had. The sun is burning down on us, but that doesn't bother us. I'm at the beach with a few friends and being closer to the water makes the heat bearable. It's more like an invitation to cool ourselves off every now and again and to enjoy the free time that we have. A stress-free holiday where the world seems to be okay and where we are not interested in seeing it any other way. I look over to my friends playing in the water, obviously having fun with each other. Life is great, I think to myself. Why can't it always be like this? I close my eyes and lean back. Give it to me, son. The full load, please. After a while, I open my eyes, still smiling, with a cool breeze caressing my body. I sit up, slightly lightheaded, and look around for my water bottle, which is gone. My bag is missing too. Then I see that my friends aren't there anymore either. Great joke, I think to myself, and stand up. I look around and it slowly dawns on me that something is wrong. Not only are my friends gone, but there isn't anybody on the beach anymore. Even for this beach, which we like as tourists don't know about it, this is strange. The rubbish bins are gone where I threw my banana peel away half an hour ago. Everything around me is so green. Am I dreaming? Is this real? The sun is still burning like earlier, and since the water is still there, I go for a swim. I follow the urge and forget my confusion for a second. However, as I look at the beach and island from the sea, I get a shock. Where am I? I recognize the shape of the mountains, but they look completely different than before. The usual brownish dry summer landscape is now all green. I can see forests that haven't been on the island for centuries. Am I in the past? Have I travelled in time? No, I must be dreaming. But everything seems so real. I slowly swim back to the beach, even though the water is only hip deep, until I can feel the sand tickling my belly. I lie there like an alligator, unmoving while my eyes scan the area. I don't even know what I'm looking for. Something, some point of reference that explains what I'm seeing that will bring clarity to my definitely confused mind. I don't feel sick or have any fear, and my senses are fully concentrated. I slowly stand up and walk to my towel that's still lying there exactly as I had left it. I cautiously pick it up, almost expecting something to happen. Nothing does, though. It behaves just like any towel would when you pick it up. I throw it over my shoulder and walk towards the parking lot where I hope to find my friends, even though I'm slowly realising that this isn't a practical joke. I can hardly recognise the parking lot anymore. The space is there, but it's full of plants, and in the middle there is now a fire pit. I walk over and test the ashes, burning my finger in the process. Someone must have been here recently as some of the ashes are still glowing. Hello? Is anyone here? Hello? I call hesitantly and then as loud as I can. Again. Hello? Except for a few birds in the trees that flee from my noise. There is no reaction. What's going on here? I ask myself loudly. And as if to answer my question, a seagull squawks overhead. It sounds as if it knows something that I don't. 
I look up and see it flying to the center of the island and without a thought my legs start to move and I start following it. It disappears out of sight and I leave the parking lot on the path we used to get here an hour ago. The path is also different than it was before. It's still there, but like everything around me, it is much greener. After a few hundred meters, I realize that it's not just sort of greener, but that everything around me is bearing fruits. There are lots of ripe and unripe fruits and they're all edible. I stop at a blackberry bush that's loaded with fat, ripe berries. I can see that a fig tree is growing out of the middle of the bush. I remember my thirst and the missing water bottle, so I pick and eat some. My God, do they taste good. The fruit juice is flowing soothingly down my throat and for a moment I forget everything else around me. I didn't know that figs could be so juicy, but they are. Sweet and juicy. Slightly captivated, I walk further down the path than I find myself standing as if rooted. A short distance away, I see a tower, a steel frame with a dome on top of it. I've seen something like this before in videos about Tesla technology, but not in the real world. Then I noticed that the old dilapidated house that lay on the way here, about 200 metres from the tower, wasn't in ruin anymore. On the contrary. It looked great and was lovingly restored and it seemed to be inhabited. The blinds were shut, but I see the terrace door is open with a white curtain blowing in the slight breeze. As if magically drawn there, I go over to the house. All around me life is in bloom. Everywhere there are insects buzzing, birds twittering and crickets chirping as if they were in a competition with each other. It's quite loud, but at the same time calm and harmonious. I stand on the terrace, about to call hello, when suddenly a woman comes out of the house, sees me, and smiles at me. Hi, it's nice that you are here. Would you like to drink some lemonade with me? I've just made some. She invites me to a table where some glasses are reflecting in the sun and puts down the jug she carries in her hand. How can I call you? She asks in a friendly tone, without any reservation. Nathan, I reply carefully and look at her directly for the first time. She's about the same age as me, with shoulder-length brown hair and a gentleness in her eyes that takes my breath away. I hardly recognize myself again. Where is the charming tone in my voice, my choice of words and my self-confidence? I'm normally not shy, but in this moment, I would love to crawl into a hole and hide. What's happening here? Hello, Nathan. I'm very glad that you came by today. The others are around somewhere, and I thought I'd have to sit here and drink my lemonade alone. I'm Samira, and I'm very glad to have you as my guest. She stretches her hand out, and I return the gesture. She pours the lemonade and gives me a glass. Amused and carefree, she looks straight into my eyes. She really seems glad to see me. The lemonade tastes great and stills my thirst, different than the berries and figs earlier. I empty my glass in one go and she squeaks with joy. That's a great compliment. Another one? I gasp for breath and thankfully hold the glass up for her to fill, which she does with a laugh before taking a drink from hers. She's so pretty sitting there, not like a model or a beauty queen, but just simply beautiful, an inner beauty that shines outwards. Again I am captivated and forget all forms of courtesy and can't get a word out of my mouth. She smiles, leans back in her chair, 
and closes her eyes with pleasure. The corners of her mouth jump a little. Then she says, You're not from here, are you? Well, sort of, I say, but I don't know where I am. With surprise and interest, she opens her eyes again and looks deeply into mine. I continue. I know this island and I've lived here for a few years, but it's completely different to what I remember. Could I be dreaming? I don't know. What are you experiencing at the moment? She asks. I tell her everything that's happened and she looks at me with wonder, but without judgment. Her look tells me that she is taking me seriously and she asks me what's different now than it was before. Well, somehow everything is. I realise that I'm on the island, but it's completely different. The first thing I've noticed is that it's so green and lush, something that I don't know at all in the summer here. Then the rubbish bins are gone. The parking lot and the path are green and full of food and there is a tower back there. How should I put it? An hour or two ago when I came here, the house was in bad shape. I spoke to my friends about it. It was such a pity that no one was using it and how many nice things could be done with it. Now it's like, well, being in a parallel universe where everything is as it should be. Thoughtfully, but still friendly, she looks at me and then over to the tower. Nathan, which year is it? 2015, as far as I know. I reply, not sure about anything anymore. She looks at me with surprise, thinks for a moment, and says in a soft voice that captivates me again, My friend, either you have amnesia, or you are a time traveller. At the moment we write the year 2020, if we write it, as it's become rather unimportant for us. And with a smile she adds, which would you prefer? Completely puzzled by this information that I would rather not have had, added to her, it's not serious, it's either the one or the other statement, I start searching for answers. I don't have the slightest idea. I don't know what happened and I don't know how the island has changed so much in five years. I think I would like to go home but it's about 20 kilometres from here. We drove here with a car before, which I can't find anymore. Maybe I can hitch a ride with someone. She looks at me, visibly amused, and I don't see what's so funny. I'm really not in the mood to laugh and I'm very confused. Maybe I can help you, she says. In the last five years, a lot has changed. Not only on the island, but all over the whole planet. I know something about you that you don't know yet, but I don't want to spoil your fun in finding it out for yourself. I can tell you some things, and then I'll tell you how to get home. Agreed? I think so, I answer. Not that I really had a choice. I look at her with interest and curiosity. Samira leans back, takes a deep breath and starts to explain. If you've already had the first half of 2015 and it's the middle of July, as I think it is now, then you haven't yet experienced that 2015 was a year of big change for lots of people, especially the second half of the year was a great time of change. I'm sure the others will tell you more about what happened, so I'm only going to tell you the essence of it, the changes that seemingly happened overnight. The political situation got dramatically worse back then, and we were facing a big war in Europe and around the world. Most people realised, however, that there wouldn't be a war if we didn't create one. 
more and more began to ignore the orders from above. They refused their cooperation and began to live their life under their own authority. The internet also helped us to organize ourselves internationally. This way, we could help each other and we started to act, each their own way, but never alone. We did that which we held for right and sensible. It started on all levels simultaneously. Parents and children came together and started to ignore the compulsory schooling rules. Many people didn't go to work anymore. And the parks and forests were suddenly much more interesting. The life forms around us started becoming more important on a personal level as we were living in dependence on each other without even noticing the essence of our fellow humans and especially that of animals. Tenants stopped paying their rent, so the owners couldn't pay the banks either. High-ranking bankers resigned from their jobs and showed solidarity. And even politicians started saying things they could identify themselves with and gave up their positions. A good description of what happened is that the people collapsed the pyramid of hierarchy. There were some unrests, but they were no bigger than those before. It was counterbalanced by the peace that became possible, as ever fewer of us were exposed to the permanent stress of the previous system. The extra time we had used for ourselves, we were connected worldwide to each other and we exchanged ideas so that we could live much better with each other instead of against each other. There was never really any lack just that some things were not available, and due to the regiment of money, it was unfairly distributed. After a while, the mainstream media couldn't help but change themselves. The problem-oriented programming disappeared and really inspiring solutions were shown. Another very important thing changed. We almost automatically stopped trying to put ourselves above others and humiliating them, at first it was a whisper in the wind, then all of a sudden everybody was talking about it. If we keep on seeing the negative side and occupying ourselves with the inapproachability, weak points and mistakes of others, then we will only suffer ourselves. In a society where we criticise 90% and praise 10% of the time, it's no wonder that life wasn't any fun. Everyone feels unnoticed, and we all have the urge to grow further, but everyone seems to be missing the enthusiasm to do so. If you do your best, but still get most negatively feedback, it takes the fun out of life. Gradually, even the slowest realised that it was caused through our interactions with each other, and that everyone could start doing it differently at any time. So by the end of 2015, life was better for a lot of people because they started acting differently themselves. They started seeing the beauty and goodness in their opposite and started enjoying their lives as there were no more stressed out people around them, only those that felt comfortable in their presence. They also started to praise more than criticise. It wasn't even that hard to do, especially around the end of the year when the media started to change. And so, something happened that few only dreamt of. We found our way back to each other.
I was fascinated with what I heard. I must be dreaming, it can't be real. I even pinched myself in the arm a few times and it hurt. My index finger also reminded me of the real experience at the fireplace. Samira took a swig from her glass and I took one too. I didn't know if my throat was dry from the heat or from the situation I was in. I've spoken enough already. You said you would like to go home. There should be a bicycle back there, but you can gladly stay a short while. I have a feeling that Manuel will be here shortly and he will be glad to drive you home in the car. I'm sure he'll tell you more on the drive, says Samira. I don't reply and my view falls on the tower that's been on my mind the whole time. What is that tower for? I ask. Before she can answer, a car pulls into the driveway and approaches us with some speed, in complete silence. Hey, what did I tell you? Cheers, Samira. That's Manuel. Come, let's go and say hello. She's with him so quickly that I have trouble keeping up. She hugs him and gives him a heartfelt kiss. Ah, her boyfriend or husband, I think, and automatically slow my approach. The couple end their hug and Samira turns to me. Manuel, this is Nathan. Nathan, this is Manuel. Nathan just came by and drank a lemonade with me. He told me a very interesting story. With a wide, friendly smile, Manuel comes over and greets me with a hug that I can't and don't really want to resist. His friendly charisma gives me a feeling of security. Welcome, amigo, he says. Nice to meet you. You look a bit confused. Is everything okay? I'm perplexed. What kind of people are all these? I'm used to being around hippies and sort of see myself as one. I'm also used to friendly contact with each other, even hugs between men. But this here is somehow different. It is so real, so natural. I can't explain it. He saw straight through my everything's cool face and spoke directly about it. A very attentive person. Two very attentive people. Still, the question remains, where am I? What story did you tell? asks Manuel on the way back to the house. I realise that my story is much more interesting to them than the one that Samira told me. I'm so bewildered about everything that I have to sit down. There, in the middle on the drive, on the ground. I'm feeling dizzy, and they are both immediately at my side helping me up. Come, we'll bring you to the veranda. You can gather yourself there. I can't even say who said it. All of a sudden, I'm in a chair on the veranda. I take my glass that's been filled for the third time with the wonderful lemonade, which in spite of the heat is still cold, and take small sips. Samira goes inside and Manuel sits down on a chair beside me. I can feel his watchful gaze resting on me and again get a feeling of complete warmth and lovingness that I can't explain. I feel appreciated and cared for as if I was the most important person in the world. It's indescribable and completely unobtrusive. Doing better, amigo? he asks with a smile. I look at him and his gaze hits me. I have really good friends and we go through thick and thin together. But his gaze is full of love, care and benevolence. I'm not used to something like this, but I don't feel uncomfortable at all. It's got nothing to do with being hit on or gay. It's more like that between a father and a son. Samira returns with a plate of cookies and joins us at the table. I take one gladly and it tastes great. Nathan can't remember anything that's happened since July 2015. If he's even experienced anything, says Samira, assuming that Manuel hasn't asked me yet. 
Manuel raises his eyebrows but doesn't say anything, giving me the chance to say something. I briefly repeat my story and he gets very excited. You don't hear that every day, he laughs and asks me directly. Are you feeling better? Everything okay? I'm feeling much better and say so. Somehow they both keep me from losing myself in my confusion. Samira told me where I've landed, but my mind doesn't want to believe it. Time travel? I find that amnesia is even less likely because the scratch on my leg from two days ago should have healed long ago. I also don't feel five years older. Speaking about my doubts seemed to be clearing my head. My senses were focusing again, and I was really interested in what was happening to me. Well says Manuel, who was obviously deep in his own thoughts. If you really want to know what's happening to you, then you must first believe in something. If you don't believe in something, then you will not be able to understand it, he answers in a seemingly self-evident and loving tone. I haven't experienced time travel myself, but on the internet there are more and more people reporting their time shifts. There is a whole group of people that busy themselves with this topic and are researching it with great interest. Since we've learned that time isn't linear and space only exists in our earlier understanding of existence, we now have a completely new space-time continuum in front of us to explore. Wait, stop. One thing after the other, please. The internet still exists and time is isn't linear? I ask. They both laugh heartily and I couldn't help but laugh with them, even if I didn't know what was so funny about what I had said. The internet is still here, though you probably wouldn't recognize it, explained Samira once we calm down. And no, time isn't linear. We only perceived it as such. Einstein back then said time is relative and not only time but everything is. Everything is relative as everything is seen from the perspective of the observer. Five minutes could pass quickly or they could last an eternity. For the one it's like that, for another it's different even if they're standing next to each other. Since the dogmas have disappeared, it became clear to us that it's worth exploring it all. And when the first people started to openly investigate it, the reports of anomalies started piling up. Please excuse the question, but have the UFOs started landing yet? They both burst out laughing and I have to laugh with them, even if I felt like the attraction at a freak show. No, Nathan, my amigo. That hasn't happened yet. There are still some waiting for that to happen, but I don't think that there is a person left on Earth who thinks that we are alone in the universe, and definitely not that we're the only intelligence. We all know today that we are not from here, that life was created by the universe and not developed on Earth. All that we see around us, everything, is held together by consciousness. We are making more contact with that which is outside the earth via our inner net, and more and more people are gaining access to it. Manuel sees my questioning look and continues. Everything is connected to everything. There is no separation. That was part of our imagination, as everything that we perceive is part of our imagination. That's because we perceive everything in ourselves and in ourselves we find the doorway to all that is. You've heard of telepathy, right? Even though we didn't speak about it, I can tell you, for example, that shortly before I returned, Samira not only felt that I would be here soon, but that she told you so too. These things function over the internet that I mentioned before. The name has mostly established itself. 
Quite a lot of information for one afternoon, I say with a deep breath. What is that tower over there? It reminds me of Nikola Tesla's experiments. I try to change the topic so that I can gather myself. Well spotted. You haven't missed that much, it seems, says Manuel, smiling. Just now I had to think about how quiet the car is. Since that's nothing new for me, and Samira also doesn't know anything different, I assumed the thought came from you. You see, we are all connected. You are connected too, even though you can't consciously use it yet. You always have been connected. The towers are positioned in certain places and supply us with what Tesla called space energy. We got access to it in 2016 when the researchers developing it stopped being persecuted and shut down. Very quickly, the first functioning models were available and they are being developed further. Some of them can't be seen anymore as they are covered in plants so that they don't spoil the view anymore. They not only supply us with energy, but our internet and telephones work through them too. The car also drives using this energy. It has a battery that charges itself when close to the towers. Is everyone like you? I ask. I hope not, answers Samira this time, but I know what you mean. You'll soon see for yourself that the people have changed. We're all much friendlier to each other now. The earth has become a very familiar place. You'll notice the animals have changed too. The energy transformation has affected them as well. They are much more trusting now. Maybe as we don't eat them thoughtlessly anymore, even if we still do. You won't find fences anymore as everything is used by everyone. That's another thing that changed without anyone having to dictate anything. Ownership thinking disappeared. No one worries about having their things taken as everyone has everything they need. Because everything is there, now just freely available. And the elite just allowed this to happen? I ask. And smiling faces look back at me. The elite, says Manuel. Who has the power, in your opinion? Well... You know, the governments, the companies, the banks, those at the top of the pyramid. As I said, in 2015, when we all withdrew our blind obedience from the pyramid, it collapsed, says Samira. The so-called power couldn't do a thing to stop it because they had no power, at least not any more than anyone else. We realised that we... Every one of us, including the elites, had the power and everything that happened, happened because of this power. Someone can only have power over another if they allow it. This obedience was the cause of all the ugly things that happened, the wars and famines. So we took our power back, piece for piece by starting to do that which we thought was right and a help to each other. So the long-hidden illusion was revealed and couldn't function anymore. That was probably the most important factor that caused the changes. We got our freedom to act back, and with it, our power too. Bit by bit, we learned how our daily actions affected us, we saw how much of that which we did was actually damaging to us. And when we realized it, we stopped almost by our own. I still find it amazing that even today, I don't know anybody who, at that time, did anything superhuman or unnatural. All of a sudden, anything was possible. And when we started to behave differently, we all became better at it. Life was fun again, and for many, that was something new, so we wanted more of it. So you're telling me that there is no crime, no hunger, hate or war anymore? I ask sceptically. Hardly any, says Manuel. 
But there are no more police, jails, lawyers or judges anymore. Everyone makes mistakes. But instead of punishment, we find it interesting and are thankful for the information which helps us identify such problems in their infancy so we can help those who are making a mistake so that it doesn't happen anymore. We don't need violence for that anymore. We have understanding. Previously, the information was locked away in prisons. Now it's a big enrichment for all. So you have sympathy for criminals, I want to know? No, we just understand how one thing leads to another and we all watch out for each other. When we see that something is leading to problems, we all jump in and help to avoid it. That's much better than blaming God for letting something happen, only to realise that we were the ones that were inattentive by allowing it to happen. What about God? I ask. I'll gladly talk about it on the way. I can feel you are restless and are wondering what happened to your home. Understandable if I put myself in your situation. Let's get going. I'll show you some things on the way there. I look over at Samira who says, Go on guys. Don't worry Nathan, we'll see each other again. I can feel it. You are always wholeheartedly welcome here. We stand up and say goodbye. She hugs me long and affectionately and then gives me the same intimate kiss that Manuel got as a greeting. I'm too shocked to react and notice how my knees go weak. She then turns to Manuel and gives him the same treatment. I don't know what to think, but I'm exploding with joy on the inside. You'll get used to it, says Manuel with a smile as he leaves her embrace. Now there is a lot of love. We've had five years to build it up. I can imagine that it's a shock for a time traveller from 2015. He takes my arm and we go to the car. Still dazed, I wave at Samira, my towel still on her shoulder. Then she disappears out of view. A while later, I accept Nathan's invitation to walk with him. Since Stefan's treatment, I've been feeling like never before. I'm completely at peace. My thoughts are focused and clear. They are positive and constructive and I just can't see any reason to be scared or feel uneasy. I notice that walking next to Nathan makes me feel even more at ease. Of all those around me, I feel understood by him the most. He really seems to know how I'm feeling, as he has already experienced it all five years ago. Even then, he seems to be a completely different person than I am. He's much calmer than I know myself to be, and is generally more level-headed. What did Stefan do to me? I ask after walking quietly through the garden for a while. And why can he do such things? He's a little shaman. We recognised it early on as he was especially interested in herbs, energy work and healing. He can't read yet, but can tell you everything about the plants around you, what they are called and their healing properties. He's like a small encyclopedia. He has great teachers and has a lot of his mother, Natalie, in him. She also does a lot of work in this direction and Stefan didn't really show interest for anything else. He quickly became a big help with her work. She can take her child to work with her? That's cool, I say, impressed. Nathan just looks at me then starts laughing. It's quite funny to see myself from another perspective. Only now do I understand what my five-year-old self said to me five years ago. He said that to me five years ago too, he adds, without answering my question. Excuse me, please, he says, and with a gesture, invites me to sit next to him on a tree stump that's been creatively carved into a bench. Try to imagine it this way. Everyone is self-employed today just that no one has to register a business. Where would they, anyway? 
It's different now. Everyone follows their interests. This is advantageous as you can do something with joy and enthusiasm. Through these interests, you learn quicker and become better. Playing and learning is the same. You can see this in the animals most. With people, it's no different. We're optimized for learning. We come into the world like this. The urge to play, the joy and enthusiasm of doing so, lets us learn quickly and effectively. The logical byproduct of playing is the improvement of our abilities and skills, our competences. I know. Two weeks ago, I saw a lecture from Andre Stern on YouTube. He never went to school and is a very well educated man. A different sort of education, but he's definitely not stupid. When you listen to him, you almost feel stupid. But he negates that by inspiring you. Can you remember that? You must also have seen it. Yes, I not only remember, but I've had the pleasure of meeting him, his father and his son. I worked a bit with them and also with Professor Gerald Huther. Andre became well known through his appearances on TV and inspired people to do a lot more not only to stop taking their kids to school as there was no alternative, he awoke the interest in enthusiasm, which the slave people of the old times, that's what we call the time until 2016, seemed to have lost. The people love him and still do so until today. His importance for the awakening people is like that of Sigmund Freud or Carl Jung a hundred years earlier. Without him, or his no credit, as he calls it, many people would not have had the idea that learning and enthusiasm are so closely tied to each other. That means that your kids can develop freely and don't have to go to school anymore? I find that hard to believe. I believe you, but it's really like that. The old school buildings are still there, but they are used in all sorts of different ways now, and no one is forced to go there anymore. When the people realised that they were forcing their children into school only to be mentally and physically abused, and yes, forcing someone to sit for hours on end on a chair has a bigger effect on their lives than we realised back then, they started to look for alternatives. Andre Stern could inspire so many because the people around him had already started looking for alternatives. How do your children learn today? How should I picture it? I would say they learn simply by living. You can't live without learning. That doesn't work even with schools. The difference between then and now is that you can choose what you're interested in and what you want to learn. And you do this with others that have the same interests. We call it the university of life. You graduate at birth and are a student and teacher of all and for all. Everyone can learn from you if they like, and you can learn from them if you like. It was always like this, but the schools blinded everyone to the fact. Everything learned outside of school was seen as inferior. There was no certificate for it, and it didn't matter how good you became. You had no papers, and couldn't use the knowledge to support your livelihood. Speaking these words reminds me of how old they are and how long I haven't spoken them. Earning a living. Today no one has to earn anything and the basics for living, not only for surviving, are freely available to all. I know that school means train, like a gardener who doesn't learn from a tree, but trains it by cutting it. The schools of the old system were to train people to become the norm. TV and media also educated the people and the result was the same. How has that all changed today? What has changed in the programming? Especially the consumption of information that was passed on as knowledge. Today we all realise one thing. 
Just because someone says something doesn't mean that it's correct. Neither in TV nor in a school. We rather perceive all as an inspiration. Information brought into form. It's all perceived relatively. No one holds endless truths. What appears clear and coherent for one isn't necessarily for the other, not because he's stupid or anything. It just invites you to explore it further if you were interested. Then we get access to that which we hardly knew earlier. True understanding. Competence that isn't based on theoretical knowledge, but on practical experience. That's a huge difference. Instead, we have less general knowledge. General knowledge is all around us. We don't need to carry it in ourselves. A show like Who Wants to Be a Millionaire wouldn't have a winner anymore. Luckily, that's not necessary anymore, as no one has a need to be a millionaire. Wealth today is defined completely differently. How? I want to know, not because I can't imagine it, but because I would like to hear someone say it who's already experiencing it, even if that someone is me in five years' time. Okay. <clears throat> I feel rich because I can pursue my own interests. Back then, only the wealthy with enough money could do so. I don't have to do anything. Only if I want to do something, I do. For example... If I want to enjoy the taste of this great apple, he reaches around and picks one from a tree, I have to eat it. It makes a huge difference to yourself if the have to comes from a need or an order, meaning if it comes from the inside or the outside. If you like, help yourself, he says with a smile and bites into the apple. You know between chews. I can still remember what it was like back then. I can remember how I allowed myself to be pressured by others and was unknowingly influenced and forced to do things that I normally wouldn't have done. Also, things that I would have liked to do but didn't do to others. Back then, our noses were so deeply buried in other people's business that the freedom and richness of today simply wasn't possible. It was a vicious circle as no one could look after themselves. They had the urge to worry about others. The word is chosen well, as it normally developed into a worry of some sort. We felt empty and that the world was against us, and we tried to compensate for this externally. The internal was mystified to death, and no one really had the chance to put their own house in order. Even those who wanted to, and did so, were bothered by others who interfered with their doings. It was very frustrating. However, as more and more people understood it, they found and helped each other against the external stresses, and so achieved a sort of immunity against them. We sit in silence next to each other, and I think of the stress I've had the last few weeks and months. I permanently had people around me that criticised me and my lifestyle. They had lots of good tips for me, or were really hostile towards me and didn't leave me alone. And all this, even though they couldn't manage their own lives. They accused me of things that they had previously told me they found wrong in their own lives. It was so obvious that they were projecting their own weaknesses on me that I should have just ignored them. But since they wouldn't leave me alone, I couldn't get away from them. There were also people there that supported me and told me not to take so much to heart. But in the end, I could only enjoy the perfect day at the beach because I could see the differences. The worst part is that it wasn't even about me, but about Bauke. I got in the crossfire because I sided with him and defended him, so I received the same rejection and treatment. What do you do today if someone tries to tell you what to do? I want to know. For a start, we laugh at them. 
and then we ask if we can help or if he wants help. If not, then we simply go somewhere else. What if it's someone at your home and disturbing the peace there? Then we send him away or just leave him sitting there. We've got the freedom today not to be tied to any place. No one has to stay where there is stress. I must admit, it's easier these days as the unpleasant people are in the minority and are dying out. Even the hard learners have now understood that each person is responsible for their own happiness or unhappiness. Whoever moans about their situation that someone did or didn't do something hasn't understood it at all. Whoever gets angry has really missed the point. He takes another bite and gives the rest of the apple back to the garden. I realise that I have a lot to learn in the next five years. I didn't stay up long yesterday. We had a great dinner, but didn't speak much about the changes the last years had brought. My head was exploding anyways. I had enough information for one day, and nothing would fit in it anymore. I was in bed early and fell asleep straight away. I was glad to wake up here again this morning, or now, depending on how you see it. The whole thing is very interesting, and I slowly realise what a unique chance this is to have this experience. Since Nathan assured me that I'll be going back sometime, I decided to enjoy every second of it. Dream or not, it doesn't matter. My experience is very real. Later that morning, I'm sitting on the terrace drinking tea, and Bauchi sits with me. Hey, sleep well? He asks with a yawn, his eyes still half closed. I guess some things don't ever change. He always was a night person and long sleeper, even if he slept the same amount as others, just later. I keep my average eight hours a day, eight hours for the body, eight for the mind, and eight for the soul, he explained to me five years ago. He also explained the hours were relative, as his day was from waking up until he went to sleep. Sometimes that was 48 hours, sometimes only two. Even then, I still admired him for his high level of balance. Now he's sitting next to me, pouring himself a juice and looking at me. Boy, boy, what a time. I must really restrain myself not to drown you in words. A thousand thoughts would like to be heard, but, he smiles at me, I still don't want to spoil your fun finding things out on your own. I know you've heard this four times already, but it won't be much longer. I know this for a reason, and for this reason, I won't tell you anything yet. I'm keeping to the script and giving you the opportunity to ask questions. As far as I'm able, I'll give you the answers gladly. How long have you known Christina? How long has she been your wife? I start with something personal. Well, and that's what she calls herself. I'd rather see myself as her man. That makes a difference for us. Our relationships today are a bit different than back then. We're not married and not exclusive to each other. And most importantly, we don't belong to each other. With the independence we gained came the awareness that we are all one and are all connected. And we realized that we didn't need another person in our lives to complete our lives. Because we all became complete. When we were ready, we found ourselves on another level. There was no reliance anymore as we knew it before. Love is defined differently than before. I explained this to you back in 2010. Back then you couldn't understand it. As like the others, you mistook desire for love. Do you remember what I said to you back then? I can remember quite well. Back then I spoke to Bohi because his YouTube videos were talking about things that were occupying me too. 
In this specific case, it was about romantic problems. My girlfriend cheated on me and I just didn't know how to handle the situation. Our relationship wasn't going that well and her turning to someone else didn't really come as a surprise. Still, I suffered and had suicide thoughts. I felt deceived, worthless and unable to make a woman happy. In one of his videos, Bauke said that it wasn't my duty to do so. That caused a few sleepless nights for me, so I gathered my courage and wrote to him. Back then, I would never have thought that we would be living together and that he would become one of my closest friends. I would also never have dreamed that five years in my future, we would be sitting at the breakfast table talking about it again. You said that unconditional love is being lived and practiced by wishing the loved person all their happiness. That means that everything the person does is okay for you. This is because by giving the other their freedom, only then are you free yourself. You said that it takes a bit of practice and in the beginning, I shouldn't be so hard on myself and others. Thanks for that, by the way. It was a great help to me. Even though I didn't have a mentionable relationship after that, I was able to wish more and more people their happiness. And one of them was definitely me. He looks at me with a loving face. You know, he says thoughtfully, it was all mostly theory back then. I had a few opportunities to gather practical experience, but compared to today, I knew nothing. I'm experiencing something with Christina that I can't describe. I would say she's the perfect sparring partner for training unconditional love. To see her laugh is still the most beautiful thing in the world for me. I like it when people laugh, but her laugh still causes the best feelings of happiness in me. The price for me is allowing her complete freedom to do what she needs to be happy. That's a small price for someone that also has the freedom to do anything without worrying about being moaned at or punished. I have other women, but I'm her man. She also has other men, but luckily she's my woman. The labelling has nothing to do with ownership, but with togetherness. We simply belong together. There are no words for it, just a feeling. We don't have to certify it or swear it to uphold it until death. No one else is devalued or worth less. We all help each other to be happy, which is a much closer connection to love itself, which Stefan helped to balance yesterday, so there is no competition anymore. There's no room for rivalry and togetherness. It's a symptom of separation. Shortly after your return to your time, you will start to see new opportunities arising through this knowledge and way of seeing things. And you've already met your girl here, he says with a smile, and I'm stumped. I don't even want to think about what I'm feeling. A face shoots into my mind and my heart beats like mad. To avoid any wishful thinking, I quickly change the topic. Back then, you told everyone you were your own king. How did that work out? It became the general attitude towards life. Back then, I said it as I was living in a world where people thought they were better than me and could tell me what to do. Since we've now all found our independence, we're all our own kings and not someone else's. Not everyone describes it like this as it's become self-evident. Today, everyone is his or herself and lives their own life. So it's not necessary to dictate over others anymore. Terra near, our earth, an alliance of free people I ponder. Yes, sort of.
Berkey laughs. A part of the project back then was to remove the territorial divisions of Mother Earth. It took some time and help from other similar networks, but it had an effect. The terranea.org website became quite popular, especially after the founder, Jonathan Leonard, found the right words to explain to everyone that not only the Earth belongs to everyone, but the network too. Until that happened, he was accused of self-serving interests. However, the accusers damaged themselves more than they did him. It wasn't only him that had these problems, but everyone that was doing such things. The guy with the most was Thomas. With Eigeland and the idea behind it, he was able to inspire people. Yeah, I can believe that. A week ago, I was on a boat with him. You made a video for the Eigeland anthem together. Oh, wow, I almost forgot that, Bauchi laughs again. The song did become popular. Somehow, we seem to have had the right timing. Thomas and Cathy are on a boat in the Bahamas at the moment, as far as I know. The song is still here, even if we haven't heard or sung it in a while. Do you still know it? he asks. Of course, I say. And he jumps up and fetches a guitar. Let's sing it again. It belongs to the soundtrack of these exciting times. Get up early every day, obey and work my life away. Doing as supposed to do, always looking up to you. Thanks, but I don't really care for the frustration everywhere i'd rather do the best i can to be a humble happy man and if you only knew if you only knew if you only knew about life's simplicity if you only knew if you only knew if you only knew about life's simplicity life is great life is sweet life is wonderful like it's supposed to be life is great life is sweet life is wonderful like it's supposed to be Thinking like you tell me to I feel like I do no good Prefer to follow Mother Earth My inner clock, the universe The sun is shining, I feel free Enjoying life's simplicity We're all in this together here A boat that takes us everywhere Takes us to a land of love With singing birds in the skies above Love everyone or two around Deep within our hearts we're bound And if you only knew If you only knew if you only knew about life's simplicity if you only knew if you only knew if you only knew about life's simplicity life is great life is sweet life is wonderful like it's supposed to be life is great Life is sweet, life is wonderful, like it's supposed to be.
cool. It still rocks. I like that song. Do you remember Ruben and the time travel video he made about the first video you guys made together where he, in his now, spoke about the recording in your now and how the listeners heard it in their now? It's all getting a different meaning now. Bauhi looks over at me and smiles. That's exactly what Ruben said after reading the book. What book? Shortly after you returned from your trip, which I now see really happened, you asked me to bring the story to paper. I was skeptical at first, but I quickly started writing. By the end of July, it was finished, and that got the wheels rolling. That's what Nathan meant yesterday and why we all know your story. It became very well known. I felt my jaw dropping. What did he just say? Does that mean I'm famous? Not famous, says Bauhi, who seems to be able to read my thoughts. Not like you're thinking. Let's say that lots of people know you, but no one knows who you are. You always have been shy in public, and that hasn't changed much, even today. I wrote the book so that you would stay anonymous. When you see Nathan again, you can ask him yourself what his opinion is. I've said enough about it. I just want you to know that, from my personal perspective, you've always been a good example for creating personal peace. You still enjoy being the great unknown one, and we're all happy with it. I also believe that if we told the people who you were, things would have happened differently, and the book would have lost its appeal. I have to digest this all. Bauke seems to notice and says nothing, plucking a bit on his guitar. A short while later, Christina returns to the terrace. She greets me warmly and tells me that she was in the garden with the boys, giving the plants some attention. Bauke also greets her warmly and intimately, which causes me to think of Samira, Shortly after, William and Stefan come too, and they greet me with beaming smiles. They seem to be enjoying having two Nathans around, and they are finding it very interesting. They too seem to know the story, and don't ask much, but seem to enjoy more. Their eyes are sparkling as if it's Christmas. They are funny and boisterous, but still somehow calm, not irritating or anything. William asks me to blow up an inflatable mattress which he fetches from behind the car. I'm happy to help him, and when I'm finished, they both disappear with it towards the pool. Christina brings a few sandwiches from the kitchen and sits down with us. How did you two meet, and how long have you been together, I want to know. Through the internet, says Christina. Back in 2015, we had contact via Facebook, And in the summer, things changed rather quickly. We both noticed through our communications that there was something more. So I came here. It was a few days after your time travel. Lots changed around here, not only through your trip. Bauchi was under pressure from Barbara and Michael, the landlords of the Finca, as they were interfering a lot in his life. Especially Barbara who saw things in him that were her own projections, got very upset. You should remember that, as you were also affected because you took his side. Oh yes, I remember that well. Yesterday I was reminded again by Nathan, and the day before I was in the middle of it all, even though it seemed so far away. In the night when Christina was on the ferry, Michael came over with Barbara and started moaning at me, as I had posted on Facebook that Christina was stuck on the mainland because her car had been towed. My gut feeling told me everything was okay, but I didn't have any proof to support my feelings. So Michael threw me out of the finca that night. 
which was bad news for Christina the next morning. I first thought that Berkey was making a fool out of me. First he invites me to visit him, and then he's trying to tell me that in the previous night he suddenly became homeless, without warning. I didn't find him so great any more, and wanted to turn around and go back home straight away. I only stayed a few days, even though I planned to stay the whole summer. And since Bauke didn't have a home any more, he came with me, back to Vienna where I lived back then. And then? It sounds like a Hollywood romance. No, not really. In Vienna we split up. I couldn't really love Bauke. All the things being said about him caused doubt in me. And I saw many negative things in him that made it impossible to spend time with him. Yes, I remember. I still know how I felt back then. To be reliant on her was exactly what I didn't want being an Eigelander, as this was exactly what I wasn't. So we went our separate ways, which really helped both of us to become independent. I wrote your book during this time, travelled around and slowly rediscovered myself again. We still stayed in contact and undeniably felt something in ourselves. When we met each other again, we took it slowly and learnt to coexist individually next to each other by allowing the other their freedom. We experienced that which connects us so closely today. Unconditional love. I don't know which day we came together, as such a day doesn't exist. We enjoy spending time with each other because it's fulfilling, but we don't need to physically be together the whole time. Two years ago, we didn't see each other for over half a year, as each of us was travelling around the world with other groups. That didn't ruin our love and connection to each other. Instead, it made the reunion much better. Are you happy with him? I asked Christina, as I know from the past that Bauke's partners weren't so. Yes, but it's because I'm happy with myself. Where I wasn't happy, I couldn't be so with him either. I know that he did everything he could so that I could be happy, but I had to learn it myself. To be happy with Bauke really isn't difficult, because he is normally happy himself. But to be happy with him, you must first be happy yourself. When you came with your story and told me I'd be living in Vienna a week later, I thought you were kidding. But if you hadn't said so, and it didn't really happen, I wouldn't have believed anything you said. Do you see now how we are all connected? asks Bauke with an insistent look. You asked how long we've been together, and here's my answer. We've all been together forever, with an infinity of different life forms. Each of us has about 12 million soul partners on Earth. That number is necessary so that we can work together to experience what one soul wants to experience over countless incarnations. It's like a big group project, and everyone is just as important. Every notion of separation is an illusion, a result of turning away from it all, especially God and ourselves, which is the program here on Earth. It doesn't matter how real it seems, nothing is really. You won't believe how quickly I became thankful towards Michael and Barbara for their contribution, as I learned something special from them. No one can really do anything bad or evil, because it can only be interpreted as bad or evil, and the interpretation is only real for the observer, no one else. I was upset at them for a few days, and felt unfairly treated, but afterwards, I could have hugged them. Not that that would have been a good idea, as it would have been impossible to enjoy anything together in that combination, especially as they preferred to concentrate on resentment for a while longer. Still, 
Without their actions, my experience wouldn't have been possible, just as none of our experiences would be possible without our so-called soul partners. They did calm down after a while, and we were able to sit down and interact with each other in a friendly way again. In the meantime, I surrounded myself with others who accepted me as I was, as they were centered themselves, and I enjoyed the times. Since then, I'm doing better than ever before. Wow, they really threw you out? What did they do with me? They left you alone as you were gone anyway. You went on a sailing trip for a few months with Thomas and Catty, and as I've heard, you were really good in ignoring their negative vibes. That's what I just couldn't do anymore. Does that answer your question to Nathan yesterday about dealing with people that don't leave you alone? Yes, I think so. Even if I can't really imagine it yet, it all sounds very theoretical at the moment. Soon you'll get the chance to see it all yourself, then you'll have the right practical experience, Christina says with a laugh. You don't need to be afraid anymore. That means I'll be sailing around the world with Thomas and Catty the next few months? The thought makes me smile. Where to? I could tell you, but that will spoil the fun. I know, I know, find out myself. We all laugh now and I feel lighter. Something was happening in me that I couldn't really explain. It was something that reminded me of Ella Kinsington's book, Mary, which I had read at the beginning of 2015 and that I had found fascinating. It tells the story of a being that was interested in life on earth and who wanted to experience all the problems that were spoken of. I really recommend reading it if you haven't yet. This being receives help from a soul called Ella, which, with the help of other souls, prepares different situations for Mary for her to experience. Ella explains to Mary that experiences are always created in this way. They are coordinated and programmed on a soul level, like a computer program, and played back and experienced as real. It's important to understand that every individual ego involved perceives it all from their perspective with their own filters so that they can experience individually. Mary is very conscious of the fact that everyone around her is doing things unconsciously for her, but it takes a while for her to realize how important her own role in the situation is for the experiences of the other egos. This reveals to the reader how all is connected. I spent some time walking through the neighborhood thinking about this. Talking to the others definitely brought new ideas and I can virtually see how my thought patterns were changing and with them my perceptions about different things. Suddenly a light goes on in me. I can now see why I'm here in a time where I don't really belong, but somehow still do. Now I know why I'm being reminded about Mary, the impression of being the main character in a Truman show, and that all seemingly exist in the situation to tell and show me something. Then I realize that I'm here, without knowing so until now, to help the others with their experience through my thoughts and actions. Then I can see how everything that happens only seems real because we all interact with each other and together we create every thinkable experience. No one can think, say or do anything other than what has been agreed to on a soul level. Any thoughts of right or wrong become relative as it is only right or wrong, in relation to something else. My thoughts become lost in the here and now, and a wave of clarity overcomes me. My senses start playing tricks on me. A wonderful scent surrounds me, the smell of all the trees, shrubs and flowers around me. 
I noticed how it was there the whole time, just that I wasn't. At least my thoughts were elsewhere. My eyes wander over to a flower field that couldn't have been more colourful. I've never seen such intense colours. I'm in a concert of quietness that doesn't need a direction or notes. I can hear birds singing, a whole chorus of them singing a song that couldn't be more beautiful. Even the cicadas are singing along. The rhythm of their chirping matches the melody of the birds. The humming of the bees and bumblebees reminds me of the bass tone of bagpipes. And it too fits perfectly in the song. This was all there before. I just didn't notice it and how it became so loud suddenly. Nothing changed. It's just now I'm listening. I can feel how my body is moving, how my breath moves through it like the warm midday sun. It's shining intensely. But in this moment, I'm at one with it and can feel it with every cell. I see a fig hanging on a tree in front of me. All I have to do is reach out and pick it. It feels so soft and pleasant. I take a bite and my taste buds explode. I can also taste it through my nose. I'm shaking on the inside as I feel how my tongue and mouth are being tickled. A pure Lust for life flows through me. Everything is so incredibly intense. In this moment, my mind stops. I can see how it just stops working. In this moment, it understands how anything is possible. It understands itself. Together with me, it can observe how it functions how everything perceived is somehow being interpreted by it. When it's really sure about something, how it then demonizes and ignores anything that challenges it. For this reason, it must always be right, even if it means our death. In a lecture from Vera F. Birkenbiel, she explains how our brain, the tool of our mind, works. An external piece of information is registered by the left half. It then asks the right half, do we know something about this? The right half digs around in the subconscious where all our experience are stored and looks for ways to interpret the information and passes them on to our thoughts. If there is nothing to find, the screen stays blank and we get the feeling that we don't understand. When our mind is programmed to always be right, we react instead of observe or listen to all things that's being said and experienced. And we don't learn anything and fall back into our habitual behaviors. As I was walking along enjoying the surroundings, I could watch my mind reprogramming itself. I didn't have a clue how I could assist or influence it. It seemed pointless anyway. I could also see how my interest pulled me into this perspective. It was that which my mind was following and it started to show me things that were necessary to experience something from a specific perspective. Suddenly, I can understand Einstein's 95% unused potential and a lot more that lies 95% unused in us. I could tell you more, but that would ruin your fun in finding out for yourself. My mind continues to reprogram itself by shooting clear thoughts through my head. Unconscious and conscious things, some that I can barely remember, and things that I don't have an explanation for, but I don't feel stupid or need to feel shame for not knowing. I can feel something in me enjoying standing in front of a black hole from which Anything can come, waiting with interest and suspense for whatever is to come next, like a cat waiting patiently. I get a feeling of being able to understand because my mind has understood that it's not necessary to grasp everything. 
but it can gain understanding of something any time it wants by simply observing situations as it is learning and in the end it will always understand it. Do you understand? Again, says my mind, and as if it was in a book, I can reread the last paragraph. Yes, comes the answer. I understand. In the meantime, I enjoy the paradise in me and around me and smile at my mind that's talking to itself and realizing that this too was always there. It also didn't only start now. It is simply change that I've now perceived, which tells me in simple logic that my world won't be the same again, and neither will I. With each step and breath, I become more one with that around me. I become the world around me. I know that I'm not it. I am that which perceives all that arises in me, watching and experiencing. I am everything around me. Not only am I connected to everything, but everything I am experiencing is me. Still, my consciousness is on another level, where it observes everything and me from a neutral point of view. And that is the only thing I perceive to be real. I turn the corner and almost walk into someone. That's me, Nathan. I stare at him with big eyes. Then I understand. The universe that I was in couldn't have made it any clearer. Talk about synchronicity. Hi there, he greets me and asks. Are you dreaming? You don't see such a nice clear gaze every day. Call me Mojo. I'll play along gladly. I look directly into his eyes. I see how Nathan's face changes and suddenly a completely different person is standing in front of me. I'm astonished, but I don't wonder about it or feel stupid. I'm just observing and there's no room for incomprehension. Something inexplicable just happened and my mind uses its first best possibility to try out the new programming. Only yesterday did I experience an inexplicable time travel, which I'm still in, and I was feeling confused, uprooted and uneasy. Now, I'm only experiencing interest, and I'm enjoying the show. Well, hello Mojo, I'm Nathan, and I think I'm really dreaming, just not in a dream world that's different from reality but in a reality that's just become a dream before we met. That's where the clear gaze comes from. I can feel the look and can't see my eyes, but I can perceive him from within me. I can feel inside myself how I'm perceiving him, how the muscles around my eyes feel and a tingling in my temples. I'm standing astounded in front of you because in the first few seconds you looked like me to me. Then your look changed when you said something that didn't fit to what I saw. Your name. And as you were speaking your voice changed too, I've just realised. I'm just as surprised. You sound as if you've just connected. Is it so? Have you used your console yet? asks Mojo, obviously interested. What console? asks my mind, just as interested, not feeling in any way inferior about the knowledge gap. 
It holds it open towards Mojo in my mind's eye, like a bag waiting to be filled with something. A thought shoots through my head. This is cool, not having to know something and being able to ask. I notice how a feeling of pleasure automatically arises in me. Yes, this is great, and no one except me has to allow it. Ugh, oh, your head, says Mojo. You really don't know what I'm talking about, do you? Uh, unfortunately not. I'm time travelling. You can think what you like, but I can't see anything else at the moment. So you're telling me you've never used your head, but can time travel? He asks with big eyes, but not in an unfriendly way. How does that work? I don't know. Why shouldn't it work? Well, because you need your head for such things. How else would you perceive something? But wait, you said you're time travelling. Where do you come from? I notice how friendly he is, and I don't have any reservations. I know from Mary that we agreed to meet here, and that no meeting can happen without a previous arrangement on a soul level. I'm standing wide awake in front of Mojo, and am feeling ecstatic. How interesting and amazing life can be if you only observe it. I can feel that Mojo has something for me, and I have something for him. That is the basis of exchange, which simply doesn't happen if there is no flow in both directions, whatever that may be. So to find out what Mojo has for me, I don't have to do anything but observe what comes next. It's like sitting in a cinema where the screen is all around me. The film has been running the whole time, but I've only noticed it now. I'm almost bursting with curiosity. I notice how the next words leave my mouth on their own, as they form themselves automatically, as if they were pre-written. Any others wouldn't have made any sense, especially not to me. 2015. I somehow landed here yesterday and have been feeling like Alice in Wonderland ever since. I've experienced things that have baffled my mind. I'm getting a new one, or at least I can see how it's creating itself. And suddenly, you're standing in front of me, telling me I've never used my head. Would you like to walk a bit with me and tell me more? Mojo looks at me with surprise. 2015? That's five years ago. I admit I haven't been playing that long, but I've become hooked. We start walking and I listen to what he says. You know what an Xbox or PlayStation is, I presume, he asks. Sure, I have one back in my time. Do you still use them? Now and again, he answers with a mischievous look. For example, to show people like you how we play today. Otherwise, the games for the head console are much cooler. Slowly, more and more people lost interest in computer games. Why only play with two senses when you have five or more to use? Let me show you what I mean. You know the graphics of the old consoles? Now close your eyes and think about the best graphics you've ever seen. Open your eyes again and look at my graphics. Look around you. That's head console graphics. And this, he cups his hands around his ears, this is my sound. Dolby surround is a joke in comparison. The head console in the standard human edition also comes with three passive senses through which impulses can be received and perceived. Can you follow? Yes, I can. I'm living on a holodeck. Always have been. I can see the analogy of the virtual computer worlds and how they copy matter. It's exactly the same. All this here isn't real, is it? I ask, pointing around me. Sure it is, he smiles, but only in the illusion. 
They aren't mutually exclusive. Reality is an illusion, but the illusion can be perceived as completely real, just like on a computer screen. You know how captivating games are on the old consoles? You can lose yourself in them, even if only two senses are being used. Now imagine you're in such a game, only you can use five senses at the same time and experience it all as being completely real from the perspective of your game avatar. How long do you think it would take to forget that you are a character in a game and not the character itself? You're just identifying yourself with the character. Somehow and sometime it happened to us all, us humans. We could not have learned certain lessons in the Matrix if we had realised that we were an illusion, like a computer game. Our fear of death, for example, definitely isn't the same since we've realised that it's all just a game. No one fears it anymore. In our time, it's become unnecessary and has virtually disappeared. I am impressed and I see myself, Nathan, from 2015, in front of me, not the face of the other, but as if he were standing next to him. I can observe him. I can see him like someone else, about whom I also don't know any more of his stories or histories. I can see Nathan's stories and the roles he played, is playing and will play. Everything exists in this moment. It all makes perfect sense now. In one moment, I can see Nathan's entire film throughout his reincarnations like folders in a filing cabinet, all nicely stored on my internal screen. In all sequences of the film, there is a storyline, which measures itself in every small detail of this epic work. I can see that nothing happens randomly without ground or cause and that's why everything in life makes sense. I really feel that I'm in a computer game. Everything seems real. The matter around me hasn't changed any through my new experience but I can now see the matrix. The 3D screen around me. It was always there right in front of me but I can only see it now. How did you know that I hadn't used my head console yet? I want to know because this answer will give me more valuable tips and clues to help my mind understand. It sits waiting like hunting dog ready to perform its task and it loves this game of words. Well, when you told me that you first saw yourself when we met, that reminded me of what happened when the first people became on mind and started playing. When you start consciously seeing the world around you as a virtual world, it starts showing itself as such. For many people that went really quick. Those that were mostly in front of their consoles hardly noticed the change, but almost everyone can tell you their experience of becoming connected. I believe that just happened to you. You've realised that everything around you isn't that what it seems, just through another method, not through on-mind gaming. Now I also realise why I had the urge to take a walk. I'm obviously here to give you an upgrade, so that you can understand what you've now unlocked. And now I can explain why you first saw yourself. You can only perceive other players through interpretation. You mustn't forget that there are no opponents. Everything is one in this world. And the old programs of Earth allowed the illusion of separation. There are no secrets, but not all information is available to everyone the whole time. Especially not where someone is in a complicated game which we all are, by the way, to learn something, as it's all the same anyway. Because you've just come out of such a game by completing the necessary tasks, things will be different for you now. 
as you've just come on mind, you have a star ticket. He has a good laugh and squints at me and says, I would love to know what I look like to you. I know you're seeing me with the star ticket. To be able to use interpretations, they must first be unlocked. You don't have to do anything for that. That's why there are tutorials. These you will recognize in conversations like this one, which are full of information and explanations. You'll find them everywhere in the game. So as you can only interpret another frequency, another player, me, the only logical interpretation that could be perceived was you. If you like, you can internally use it for interactions with other players globally. That helps a lot in reminding you that every other player is there to reflect and act as a mirror for you. It's a monitor, he explains, pointing to all around us with stretched out arms. We're walking next to each other here, but you can be sure that I'm seeing everything here completely differently than you are. That's due to the fact that perception works selectively. Each player builds their own world. Some of us are really, really good at it. When they unlock their perceptions, everyone can see through their eyes. You can download whole sets of filters and look at the world through the eyes of almost anyone. Some people don't want to play yet and don't want to use their heads. They call it the devil's work and call us hellspawn because they're afraid when we do such things. He raises his arm slightly and a fist-sized rock floats slowly off the ground into his hand, light as a feather. He looks at me knowingly, takes aim and throws it up high. It disappears into the sky and doesn't return. There are still some dinosaurs around, but they are dying out. They are choking on their own hate. I see images in Nathan's imagination of dinosaurs choking on their own hate. But one of them looks like Mrs. Merkel. She doesn't look at all well, Nathan's mind thinks. I see the sister, who I'm one with, who is still there to act as a reflection for others, and I feel empathy. Stay strong, brave girl, I send to her. Nathan and I see how her face changes and she gets a coughing fit. Love is killing her explains Nathan's mind. Can you send a heartfelt message? Nathan's mind wants to know. And the question is asked through Nathan. I can see the processes happening, how something is done through someone, divinely inspired. Everything seems to be running like the gears of a clock and it continues fluidly. Yes, answers Mojo. It's like sending an email. You think of the receiver and send a thought or feeling or both or smells or tastes. This has always been called telepathy and we've actually always been using it. Just that we haven't realised it as we've been distracted the whole time. Now, through online gaming and because it's spreading so quickly as more and more players are connecting by consciously living their lives as if in a computer game, wherever they are, we are able to use these great abilities. Word spread quickly about the on-mind gaming freaks, that we are harmless and lovable freaks, he says with a wide smile. However, these freaks began to spread team play around the world. When you know that there are no opponents, you also can't treat anybody as one. So you're then perceived as being pleasant company. Then even the hardliners in the counterculture didn't have arguments anymore. So it's simply spread like that? Asks Nathan. In his imagination, 
Things like that first connected energetically, then broke out with perfect timing. There seemed to be an interest everywhere already. There was an underground radio station on the internet back then, okitalk.com, where everyone was suddenly speaking of the equality of virtual and real worlds, and the listeners were captivated. I was also one back then. A friend told me about Okie Talk and that I should really listen in. Two days later, I was reminded again, once by what's up. So I clicked on the link and an hour later, my world wasn't the same again. I was chilling with my buddies in the park and after 10 minutes, we were all captivated. There were people speaking about a new generation of game consoles who were apparently using them already and that well enough to speak several times a week about them. Others were speaking about the new ways of seeing things. It was interesting and extremely helpful. They spoke about free energy and generally about energy itself, about what was happening around us and why. Suddenly, everybody was speaking to each other. There only seemed to be expansions and no contradictions. Everyone could and should say what they were thinking. For a while, most comments started with, what suddenly came to my mind was, it was a big help in seeing all points of view and it didn't matter who said what. No one complained about not being able to speak as we were all invited to speak. If they had more to say than what fit in a show, they could simply make their own channel on okitalk.com, YouTube, Facebook and countless other channels. And that caused people to free their spirits and accept any thoughts that came and speak freely about them. You now also peaked around that time. Suddenly, Everyone who had the urge turned on their webcams and shared their thoughts with the world. A network of free people, Terra Nia, also became known through Okie Talk. It reminded us that, regardless of which country we are in, we were all on Earth. Our Earth. Terra Nia. That's what it means. We started discussing about who decides which nationality a person is and that countries themselves are nothing more than illusions in our heads. They weren't our borders. And the more we played on mind, the more we realised so. And we started transcending them, even physically. Tarania issued identity documents for each person that wanted to be a citizen of Earth. When the first people started reporting that they could order plane tickets with the IDs and could enter and leave Russia and China without problems, the whole platform boomed. Suddenly, everyone got the feeling they could do something. The stagnation we were all sitting in dissolved because we started taking action. Everyone joined up. We started spreading new inspiration all over in any way we could, always taking care not to be imposing. No one was to be preached to. It was sufficient to talk to people who were interested. And when it was done outside, it didn't take long and more people joined in and listened. We started spreading love in the pedestrian areas and all over together with those that wanted to by demonstratively kissing and hugging each other, being human monuments for love, calm and peace. It was a real phenomenon. 
It started as a flash mob, which became increasingly popular and didn't stop. It was a sort of job. We started taking the time to hug each other for minutes at a time, to greet each other and kiss and cuddle, because it was just so pleasant and didn't cost a cent. It charged us with energy, and you could see the energy being transferred to the surroundings. No one had any reason to be jealous. Since we were consciously following our internal impulses, we all saw the growing number of synchronicities and our interest showed us with whom we could do such things. We could see it in the look of another and our senses burnt through. We all know the feeling of meeting someone where their appearance takes our breath away. It's a great hindrance when we can't follow our impulses because we're not allowed to for whatever reason. The wife won't be impressed or because of all the people around you. When we realised how impeding the desire for togetherness was as portrayed by Hollywood romances, when instead we could have it here and now every day. We saw how these expectations weren't the best for us, so we freed ourselves mutually. It didn't take long before we also freed ourselves sexually. We started allowing each other the freedom to do anything, especially those we loved the most, so that the people got what they needed to be happy, so no one felt alone anymore, as there was always someone there for you. It didn't change our feelings for each other. We just started using our possibilities. It started with kissing. Kissing is contagious, just like yawning is. When you allow yourself to do it, wherever there is a chance, and we just did it as no one could really stop us, it had the corresponding effect. The best part about it was that Everyone had the feeling that something was changing because we were changing it. It was our story and we were writing it with all that we thought, said or did. Things changed and the changes endured. I was there and it was a great time, he finishes, eyes sparkling. I still remember walking my dog in the city at night and writing okitok.com on every wall and lamppost. I was one of many. I was 19 back then and in a truth movement. I had a blog about 9-11, but after a while, the vibe of the others started pulling me down. I joined this movement in September 2015 and a few weeks later, my life changed. I suddenly knew what to do. I spread the message and sent friends the okitalk.com link, inviting them to have a listen. And since so many of us did, more and more also started listening and didn't leave either. Many started to give talks themselves, made videos and radio shows and spoke about what they were thinking. The result was that TV programs didn't show us what we wanted to see, but here we could listen to what we wanted to hear. We started to think out loud and use our head consoles. We spoke to everyone around us that was interested and more and more became interested. A whole generation of people who were waiting in front of their screens for the starting gun stood up and started speaking. Some were shy, some were emotional, but they all spoke. That caused a big murmuring. It was almost scary. It sounded like the humming of bees and it spread out over the whole planet. You could hear it wherever there were people around. People that were now speaking to each other and listening to what the other had to say. Sometimes two or three were speaking at the same time, but we realised that the words which were important for ourselves would be the ones that would be heard, regardless of who was speaking them. The dogmatism disappeared, and there were no more arguments or conflicts. 
the great mumbling lasted for three days and three nights and was only the tip of the iceberg, which was the result of what a few people started previously, opening themselves up and telling the world via webcam what they were really thinking. Then everyone was talking, as if in trance. Ears were opening and we started listening. Three days and three nights. The murmuring silenced all other noise on earth. The machines were quiet. The loudmouths and stress bringers, the traffic and weapons, TV and radio. The politicians were silent. And for many, the spirit too. After that, everything was different. There were no material changes. Everything lay as it was before. But there was a change. We had a new base of communication, a simple and effective one. We could speak to each other. Only then did we realize what the difference was. That alone changed the world noticeably. After that, nothing was the same again. We could concentrate on the old problems and their solutions in a different way. It took a while to get used to it, and there the radio shows helped us again. We could train a new form of communication. Our way of speaking also changed bit by bit. The words were mostly the same, but we started to use language in a completely different way. Can you follow? That was the first noticeable change that we felt. One man became quite interesting for a brief time as he started an experiment about appreciation. Bodo Delitz, co-author of The Mary Book. He had gathered thousands of people worldwide together. Every Sunday at 1950, irrespective of where they were, they would meet in a mental room in the Matrix to spend time working on their ability to appreciate. In the lives of the people, there was seemingly always more to appreciate. That was on mind gaming. And the people were using it for months on end without even realizing it. Bodo Delitz, I was just thinking of him. Of course, yes, I was also participating. Not every week, but my cell phone was set for Sundays, 2040. That's incredible, Nathan's mind thinks with excitement. However, Nathan continues calmly. Not interesting. Not relevant. Carry on listening. Nathan's mind is talking in two different tones to itself. The calm one throttles the hectic one. And so Mojo can continue. The two groups connected, the appreciators and the on-mind gamers. Then the first group also started sharing their thoughts on Okie Talk with anyone that was interested. Thousands of people heard about the things all around them that could be appreciated. They just didn't have the right perception to be able to do so. Now they got the download And something unbelievable happened. Suddenly, you only met relaxed and happy people on the street. It was like carnival time, just without the alcohol. The people were tipsy, but not drunk. More like an LSD trip, in my opinion. At least, that's how I felt. Weeks and months passed, and it didn't stop. Mid-2016, there was an Okitok festival close to Vienna in the middle of Austria. Whole hordes of people came from all over the world. There was no lineup, no planning, and no secret people in charge. There were no entrance fees. Everyone brought what they needed and took their rubbish with them again. That has never happened before. It reminded me of a rainbow gathering, but everyone was there was not only the rainbow family, 
but every type of person from every walk of life. All equals. It was anarchy, the opposite of hierarchy. Here we found that anarchy didn't have the least to do with chaos. Things here could freely develop. We were led to believe a load of rubbish back then, he says with a cheeky smile. Understood, says Nathan's mind, and I decide that's what it should say. The talk wasn't being interpreted, but instead the jibe was an invitation to interact. If we were on a stage, it would have been Nathan's cue. Through my feelings, Nathan gets an impulse to say something, and he says the freshest thing in his mind. Understood. We were led to believe a load of rubbish. Mojo nods in acknowledgement. Make sure that you do it when you return to your time. The Oki Talk Festival was a flash. The idea ingenious. There were no bands booked, but since we had the chance to meet several of them that we knew from the internet personally, we all went there and we were our own stars. The rules were simple. Maximum two weeks, then we must leave without a trace. That was the entrance fee. On the first say, hundreds of cars, caravans, trucks, tractors, hay and all sorts of things loaded arrived. On the third day, there were a few thousand and small huts, tents and houses popped up all over, not randomly but organised so that there was space around you, with paths and streets between them all. In the evenings, we all sat around a huge fire. Imagine that. Thousands of people sitting in a circle with a fire in the middle. You could hear drums, guitars, bagpipes and didgeridoos. Lots were singing and dancing in the middle of the circle. Suddenly, the tone stayed constant and everyone started to hum along. No one gave a signal. Everyone just stopped drumming and you could only hear singing in the same tone, which got louder and louder. Everyone sang along, you too. And the song became a scream, not aggressive or hectic more like an adult bear would, just not as bearish, if you know what I mean, sort of like a whoa. The drums suddenly started beating again, and everyone jumped up laughing and cheering, and they all started to dance. All around, the people were hugging and kissing. Two days later, a big truck from a stage company arrived, The boss asked with a wink if he could store his stage here for a while. He and his team would be here and would help if needed. Then it was a go. I'll make it brief. Everyone pulled out their phones and webcams and invited bands that they knew here. The first three concerts happened that night. The bands were crap, but the atmosphere was fantastic. Then it took off. At the start of week two, Nina Hagen was on stage, and when videos of the first concert got out, while it was still on, thousands and tens of thousands came streaming there, even some well-known bands. By the end of the week, it had grown to seven big stages. Each band could register themselves, and the public voted as to who would play next. Whichever band got the most votes for a time slot got to play. There were also lots of recitals on smaller stages and tents all around. When the space got tight, there was a vote held there too. Democracy in the anarchy camp. By the end of the second week, there were some 1.5 million people, if not two there. We could only guess. A hell of a lot of people who
who demonstrated that they could look after themselves and have a lot of fun together. It was a gigantic peace demonstration, not for or against something, but to show how we can live as equals with each other. The platform that organised it back then was consensuren.eu, as it offered everything needed to find a consensus about problems, which meant that everyone's interests were included. Everyone had an equal chance and a right to say what they were thinking, and everyone could constructively participate as all suggestions got the chance to be regarded. It was a vote based on the SC principle, systematic consensus. Today, almost everyone has an SC account, but there are also many that manage without it, and some hardly use theirs anymore. When something has to be sorted out, the whole world can potentially help you. It's the same as Facebook was back then. Everyone could simply add their opinion to the matter, share their thoughts and get feedback. Today, you can see us doing the same thing, just in a different way, constructively and in consensus. Through the Okie Talk Festival and the mass of other gatherings that followed all over the world, anyone could contribute to solutions and get help on their own by getting an account at consensieren.eu. It became obvious how many quick and individual solutions came from the platform. It didn't take long before we overrode the political system. It didn't make sense to anybody anymore. Even the politicians were speechless over the logic of the phenomenon, which was happening in front of our eyes, through us. We stood up and began to sort out our own problems between us. We were tired of waiting on others, who did nothing but talk while nothing changed. When the first politicians set up their SC accounts, politics simply disappeared. A coup wasn't necessary, no uprising or emotional speeches, and no funeral celebration. It simply disappeared, as no one was interested anymore, without a peep. Like a flower in the forest, it died and rotted, and no one noticed. Something else had our interest now. Terra near, our earth. I lay at our feet, and from there, lasting peace spread out into the world. Billions followed the spectacle online, and that was the first big online meeting. So many online contacts in one room in the matrix, millions of us. In the cities and other places around Earth, masses of people got together and spread the festival over the planet. It had many names and became an institution. To today, we still gather up and then go our separate ways freely. We're always connected. No one is alone. Like a flock of birds, we cross our paths like a dance, just like you and I did today. Every cell of the organism is following its own interest and it becomes a fluid movement that connects us all. At times, we are further apart, other times, close together. But nothing is ever permanent, and we are always free. There is no reason for jealousy, as each one of us can care for himself. No one is busy deceiving or cheating another, as we've all understood that it's not good for us, and it only works against us. The change was a logical result of us all being able to speak our minds, and like a game on a console, we could all train together with the absolute safety of knowing that nothing bad can happen. It really knocked me off my feet back then. My friend, I can only recommend that you go there. 
There were many that kicked themselves afterwards, as there was never another Okie Talk festival, because there was no need for one. On the last day, all the people showed that in spite of the masses, they could leave the area clean and tidy. There were lots of marks, but not a piece of litter left over, and the marks were gone in a few months. The people didn't just leave. They took with them an open and heart-filled spirit that defined the festival. They had shared many new connections, inspirations and experiences with others, and no one wanted to wait another year for it to happen again. It didn't matter where they went afterwards, and many didn't return to where they came from. They took friends and a lust for life with them, a feeling of connectedness and unconditional love. They spread it wherever they landed, an army of appreciative on-mind gamers on the last march towards freedom by simply living. And that's why it really asserted itself. World peace? Yes, you could say. Would you like a few beginner's tips about online gaming? Of course. That's why I'm here. Okay, here's a start. Your imagination, the ability to see something in our mind, gives you the chance to use a head-up display. All you have to do is imagine it. Try imagining a screen where there is a row of slots on the left-hand border from top to bottom. Into these slots, you can then insert games that you know and interest you. Not like conventional consoles though, one at a time, but as many as you like simultaneously. By doing this, all the worlds from all the games become one. You can also deactivate games as you like. Just imagine yourself doing it. A thought is normally enough but you can also add an on-off button to each one to make it easier. It just takes a bit longer. When you are more practiced, you can almost do it asleep. Now, imagine a horizontal taskbar. It contains all the characters that you've ever met, where you've observed a behavior. In some games, you must use certain figures, which ones is dependent on your setup. On the left are the characters that you use the most, on the right the other ones. When you are in a situation where a specific action is necessary to solve a problem, you should have a character that can solve it. You simply activate it by clicking on it and then you are playing with it. You can also play multiple characters at the same time. That's like Mega Man. He has the abilities and experiences of the grouped characters. You now have one. That's Nathan. You can do what you like with him, redesign or rename him. On the higher levels, he can become a woman and you can develop other characters. But know that others can see your frequency, your profile picture, so to say, and not the character you are currently playing. To them, you look the same as always. You only have one avatar, your body, through which you play all your characters or egos. That's why you can perceive them all from within it. Depending on how much you play with your characters, your body may start adapting. With practice, you can even change it however you like. 
You can join up with other avatars in the multiplayer mode, connect and exchange with them, and do all sorts of things, like the new sort of sex, which I can't explain to you as you don't understand it yet. It won't take long, and you can do it all yourself. Ah, look, we've arrived in the city. Nathan just stands there, amazed. I can see him standing there, with his mouth open, and eyes as big as saucers. I can feel love. Unbelievable, Nathan's mind switches on. I've been walking towards it for an hour and didn't see it. It can't be. How cool is that? I like it when cities are built without messing up the landscape. If that is from memory, a quote heard somewhere. It was on TV and sounded good. This here does not only not ruin the landscape, but it is invisible from the outside. How did they do that? A black hole appears on Nathan's imagination screen. We don't have information on this. We don't understand it. Then something is there that has never been there before. Nathan's mind is waiting for instructions, an order. I realize that I'm the player. I feel like I'm sitting on the couch with an Xbox controller in my hand, completely befuddled, and see that everything on the screen in front of me is happening because of certain programming so that I can push the right button at the right time. I recognize myself. Nathan's mind doesn't have two voices, but the quiet one is mine. That is me. And I can see that it's always been so. The voice in my head that's been asking me how much longer I want to do things to myself. The voice that I'd been avoiding for so long because it's been tempting me when it spoke. Now, I experience myself as being above Nathan. I've become one with all as I always have been, and I'm only experiencing something here. I can see him slightly to the left in front of me, standing there with an open mouth and staring. And to the right, I see his mind crystal clear. There we are. There where all is one. The father, me, the son, Nathan, and the Holy Spirit, Nathan's mind. And so I find myself on the couch again. Mr. Holy Spirit takes the question about if this is all true and puts it on the screen, only to drag it into the paper bin bottom right. I'm amazed to see how quickly it learns and a wave of love streams through me. I reach out my arms and pull them both towards me. It feels like a long overdue reunion. I squeeze them both tightly and cover them with myself and am one with them. The feeling of the hug lasts an eternity. It feels like home. This is the peace that I've been missing so much. The peace within myself. I'm overflowing with love and then get a feeling of boundless gratitude like I've never felt before. Then I melt, I dissolve completely and become pure energy and to notice that it was always so, just that I am starting to perceive it again. I am energy. It was always so, nothing new. The experience reminds me of the one that consists of all the ones, like an organism consists of all its cells. That which I am and that creates all the players. I can perceive with countless senses the 
all one and that I am. I can feel throughout the whole organism how each cell is following their calling, their interests. One of my cells, Nathan, is standing there in the center of infinite consciousness. I look at all the other cells, each one, then I return back to him because then I would have to tell a completely different story. I only mentioned this to explain that I could do so from here, for every life that has been, is being, and will be lived. They all exist here, in me, in all that is. Nothing can feel excluded from it. Here where I am, in this moment, Bauchi is writing this so that all the cells that are interested can read it. Let's call the moment now. I am the creator of this universe, which is infinitely experiencing itself and redefining itself. You are too, Mrs. Muller, around the corner and Pastor Meyer Grunhausen, the flowers and the bees and everything else, all that exists and doesn't yet exist. I'm existing and experiencing myself through you, who are currently reading this to remind yourselves that you are all me. You even call yourself so, not that silly it seems as everyone is me. I'm looking through all your eyes at the same time, through all space and time, because outside of me, nothing can exist. It is all me. Endless consciousness with the ability to follow any interest and to experience life. It's just amazing and doesn't need an explanation just because it's possible and wants to be experienced. Anything that wants to be experienced must desire to be experienced. Otherwise, it can't be experienced. That's why no cell can experience anything else than what it wants to as each cell is a flowing its interests that I can't influence, as my interest is the sum of all the individual interests. If I were to interfere or change your interest, I would change myself as you are all me. I've said that already, haven't I? Just because you argue and go against me by turning away from yourselves or robbing other cells of their energy or disturbing their peace, it doesn't mean I have to do so as a complete organism. I believe that would be unpleasant. There aren't that many of you on earth. I'll manage without you. I have to smile at this thought. It seems to be the right time for these words to flow into your matrix. They will help you. Let's return to Nathan Bauchi and to you who are reading or hearing these words. I return to each of you and take my place lightly behind you and your Mr. Holy Spirit. I was never gone. I'm just back with full attention and I'm watching the film further. Who wants to watch with me? I'll return to you all, but let's continue Nathan's story. Hopefully, you'll be able to consciously experience your own stories now. He stands there for a few seconds without saying a word. I can see him in front of me, and Mr. H. Spirit is next to him, looking at me inquiringly. Well, go ahead, I say, and activate Nathan from his rigor. Wow, this is great. How did they do it? He asks. 
I can see him acting through his programmed behaviour patterns. Or to put it another way differently, his way. It's all the same. I like his amazement. Another wave of love streams through me. And I can feel it spreading throughout the whole organism. Sometimes more, sometimes less noticeable. But I can feel that in each moment, every frequency crosses the entire universe. And how the slightest difference changes the whole frequency. I like this position. Nathan's watchtower. I get the feeling that ever more cells are consciously experiencing the position. Well, it's really not that hard with clean seed stock, says Mojo. But we started really early here. We made the city green and pretty together. We planted tall trees and shrubs everywhere. And four years later, you couldn't see the houses from the outside anymore. Our eyes meet suddenly, and I can see myself in him. God, looking into his own eyes. Ah, well, hello there. Now you have a clear view. Welcome to the internet, he greets me pleasantly. From now on, your life will never be the same again even after you return to your time. I know this look very well. I've seen it a hundred times. You have the Trinity experience, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and so on. Most of us in the West had it, as we were shaped by Catholicism. But in the end, each gamer had their own sort of experience. When you start using the head console, you will also remember who the gamer is. Then you see things from a different perspective and feel the connection to everything. You're at home at last and experience your life differently. Call it what you like, hatching from an egg or breaking out of your cocoon. You're someone different now, namely the creator of all experience, doing so through us, or as we say, playing through us, like a computer game where you can experience yourself anew over and over. Did we learn something from this tutorial, he asks. Well, I don't know if you learned anything, but I've had the lesson of my life. I'm really grateful for your help and for enabling this lesson. I thank him with all my heart. I like doing such things. I do them gladly. What about sex? I give Nathan the impulse to speak Mr. Spirit's thoughts and see how in this moment I'm steering the story further. Me, in this moment, I'm playing. I can see how I'm playing through Nathan in the here and now. And everywhere around me, the other players or cells are doing so in their here and now. Life is a time loop. Now I have something great for myself lined up and go back into Nathan's perspective to see the following situation from his view. That's what it's for. That's why it's there. Every pair of eyes perceives through their own filters. I know that Nathan's story is really enthralling, and I know you also find it so. Now, let's experience further together with him. I'll report back from the viewer perspective soon. Mojo! A woman's voice calls before he could answer my question. She's sitting on a leaf-covered terrace of a cafe with a few tables on it. The cafe's name is Café Olé and is covered in flowers and fruits. Everywhere are leaves, endless greenery for a city. I look down the street 
which disappears into the thick green like a forest city. Simply ingenious. She jumps up and runs over to us. Like in a time lapse, I see her coming. An indescribably beautiful woman with long blonde hair and a dream figure. And as she gets closer, I see her full lips, cute nose and wonderful eyes. She falls into Mojo's arms and gives him an intimate kiss. She straightens up and looks him deep in the eyes, right in front of me. I notice how I'm one with my spirit and my inner me. Then she kisses him again, without breaking eye contact. Her tongue plays around his lips and he looks back, grabs her hips and pulls her closer to him. She draws herself to him and they suddenly are both strongly shaking. Their eyes closed and a wave of love streams through me and my whole insides as the one hugs them both and becomes part of the energy that these two created and are spreading around them. They collapse, fall to the ground and start laughing. A few spectators laugh along and applaud them loudly. The last problems I had about perceiving the interactive film in front of me just dissolve. It's almost like a comedy. Mojo breaks the hug and smiles at me. I can't do anything but smile back. And I really feel like smiling. S-E-X, he says. Synergetic energy exchange. It's based on a connection that's completely open in both directions. When neither of the parties wants or needs anything from the other, but like Tamara and myself want to give and share, then the energies synchronize through the exchange and become stronger and stronger and spread out. In these energies, it's all much more productive, balanced and comfortable. That is the base energy of Earth today. It doesn't need anything more than to experience nice things like this here. It's the energy of anarchy, of equals. Can you follow? I think so. I guess I'll get to experience it. I smile and bashfully add, Hello Tamara, call me Nathan. I'm a latecomer and I'm thankful for your help with the exemplary demonstration with my tutor, Mojo. I've only just started using my head console and he's helping me get used to it. However, the last five years are missing. Oh, that just now, your kiss. It was a joy to experience. It was a sort of dance. It had an incredible vibrancy. Hello, Nathan. It's a joy to greet you in my perception. And you're right in a way. It was a sort of dance. We're practicing such things. It's the best method to get an energy boost for both parties. She seems to find the situation completely normal, without any judgment. She accepts my story, registers it and sees I need certain updates, which she gives by talking further. So, you're interested in SEX and are missing five years of information on it, she concludes. And I feel like I'm in a merry camp. After reading the book, I couldn't break the perception that I was in a merry camp. The book was finished, but the story around me continued. 
everyone that I met seemed to have a message for me, or I had one for them. I saw how we all met to keep our appointments, but the others couldn't, so the feeling slowly left me. Now, it's fully there again. I see myself in a married camp, and all the others see the same. That we're all in the camp, call it what you like. We were all here because we wanted to be. Tamara appeared now because she wanted to experience this moment as she could be the one to play her role in it. She wants to because she loves to. Teaching freshlings, that's for her. I can see it in her eyes, in her whole being, how she approaches me and how it's bursting out of all her cells. Yes, this girl wants to. She has a sweet smell of ecstasy and she gently lays her arms around my neck. I can see her beautiful face in front of me, the full red lips and shining white teeth, her really cute nose and eyelids lowered and are closed. She opens her mouth and my breathing stops. She opens her eyelids and looks me directly in the eyes. Then she gently presses her thigh into my crotch. My heart misses a beat and time stands still. Everything around me carries on as normal, but time stands still. In this moment, I feel how relative it is. Everything happens in its own tempo, as every ego, every player, has their own feeling for time. And as I've just found myself again, I jump into the relaxed viewing mode from the perspective of Nathan's story, who is watching everything like a film in the here and now, beyond space and time. Time stands still because I am able to, in this story known as Nathan's, distance myself from the ego identification. In the meantime, many more have too, those reading the story. Because of this change, time stops, because it is an illusion, a tool to organize experiences chronologically to create plots and stories. Because we are all remembering more about whom we really are. I am. We identify and feel more and more like me. That's why the illusion of time is crumbling. It's a pity when someone pities it. I can recommend exploring the new space-time, a place full of endless possibilities within the matrix, where everything can be experienced that wants to be experienced, as it has always been. Nothing has changed here either, except that it's being experienced more consciously, bit for bit, step by step. Each one is following their own interests. Every interest is being followed. It can be no other way as everything happens through us. All this is also being experienced as Nathan. Nathan and I am one. And together we feel the wave of love flowing through his body. Her gaze draws mine to hers, without really pulling it. I want to lose myself in it. I let myself fall, and then I feel her tongue touch the middle of my upper lip. I explode through my whole body, and I close my eyes. I come into the middle of the universe, surrounded by all permeating consciousness. Nathan's body collapses, but I'm completely lucid. 
I can see myself lying there as if unconscious from above and behind myself and I see how I'm shining. Everything is bright. Everything becomes light. Tamara's body is also twitching, but she manages to gracefully catch both bodies and gently lower them to the ground. This woman knows what she's doing. The spectators could also see what was going on. After Mojo's dance before, a few people stopped and were watching with interest. Now they were cheering us on. Tamara, your tutorials are the best, someone says. You don't waste time and just show them before they can ask questions. Brilliant, the people cheer. Tamara and Nathan open their eyes together and look at each other. And then they laugh, shake themselves and roll around on the ground, hug each other and come to rest. After a few last sighs, they sit up. I break our gaze and look around me, dazed but full of lust for life around me. People around us are hugging, like in a game without any worries, and thank each other and then us, and go their separate ways. I direct Nathan's look to Mojo, and he is smiling at me. I think that answered a few questions about the energy we spoke about. How would you describe it? As I said, Tamara has her own methods. As usual, she has perfect timing and flow. She is very good, if not an excellent artist of love. She is well known and respected. She has lots of sensitivity for it. I'll leave you two alone now. I can feel that I'm needed elsewhere. I have an appointment. See you on the internet. Just think of me and we're connected. At the start, your wires might be a bit rusty, but that will pass as they are being reconfigured. It will happen on its own. So chill further on your internal couch and play with life, brother. With a wink, he disappears into the forest or city around the corner, whatever. Like a dream, he disappears out of my scene and into the next one. That too has always been so. It's not only now that I can see it. Now that my mind isn't permanently in self-defense mode, it can perceive such things. Like a ghost, the Holy Ghost. Let's call him Jack. In the meantime, the film is continuing, endlessly, forever, unstoppable, the whole time, even now. I have a new friend, an invisible one. From now on, I'll never be alone again. Nathan and Jack are a team, fully conscious, and I like it. Love flows through me again and I look at Tamara, who's still lying on the ground next to me, smiling. I just, I just like to amaze people, she says lovingly. Thank you for your interest. Your question in the network just jumped at me. My question? Yes, there was a black hole in front of you just now. A knowledge gap because you didn't understand the context, as you didn't know which sort of energy was being spoken about. This energy is my passion. So I search through the internet looking for questions to see where I can help others by using my passion. That's how we do things today. Through your feeling, you sent your interest in this direction, and on the net, the internet, Everyone can see it. So I saw the opportunity and jumped at it. A few impulses later, we're sitting here and you have your update. And if you like, we can spend some time together and we'll see what happens.
You said you don't have any memories of the last five years, since 2015? Well, I've had quite a few. Your statement triggered a lot of pop-ups on my screen. Memories of the time back then. And they're obviously there to be copied into your head. We'll do this the old school way. By me telling you the stories about the pictures you'll be seeing. In the meantime, you can see how well you're doing seeing through my eyes. Then we won't only be copying the information, but we'll fine tune your empathy at the same time. Do as much as possible at once, but one thing after another. Are you ready? Do you want to? Yes, of course. Nothing has my interest more at the moment. Except for Samira. Now, Jack beams her picture onto the screen. I stand still and do nothing else but observe, consciously. Together with the father, let's call him Papa, I can watch Jack. My mind obviously did something resulting from an old programming that tempted me. The three of us are watching this reaction caused by my views and my filters and I notice that I'm tending to feel bad because my attitude towards the situation isn't harmonious. Show me, I say to Jack, I want to see. Jack points to the monitor where Samira's face still is. Love flows through me and everything gets a bit brighter. Then I get my impulse from Papa and my gaze flows my interest and wanders to her face. I now see them next to each other and feel a disharmony. Jack is throwing pieces of memories onto the screen, arguments and jealousy, horrible moments and at the end, dramatically and slowly, the memory of a crying ex. I observe it all and how my own uneasy feeling is growing, but I don't feel guilty. I know Papa is looking out for me and nothing bad can happen. Jack looks at me thoughtfully from his place. I see how he's been busy processing in the background. He looks up at Papa and says what he's thinking. I'm following my programming, as you are yours, brother. It's nice to see that you're happy that I've started reprogramming myself. But remember that you are also only the product of your programming. Even if you call them habits or points of view, it's all the same. It's been blinding you do just as it has been doing so with me. How about some teamwork, eh? I look at him and see him properly for the first time. How he's been on my right side all my life. My invisible spirit friend, my brother. An indispensable part of me that I haven't been perceiving properly for a long time. Now I'm doing it. I perceive him as I would another person, like myself. Thankfully, I wink at him, my pleasure, but this time without the oops. Let's get back to Tamara. He winks back and the focus wanders back to the two wonderful women. Papa guides me to look slightly to the left and Tamara's face moves to the middle of my view, the external screen. On my internal screen, they overlap each other and for the first time, I see it consciously. The whole area as well, even though I know that I haven't been anywhere else. I feel at home and in safety like never before. What is this place? This here and now, you call it. The most descriptive name beyond space and time would be 
perception. It's a place that consists of infinite other places and times in which there are infinite possibilities and experiences and it's just one of the infinite number of such places or perceptions. Here I can enter other bigger places and times and together with others I can share my experiences. Your unease comes from your views which are you can't fall in love with one woman then the next then kiss her she knocked me off my feet and I don't know if I cheated or not but I don't want to hurt Samira blah 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 do you see yes I can I recognize myself Nathan in there those are my views that's how people know me and expect me to behave. That is exactly the point that we have to work on. As a team, a unit, as we're compatible and basically work the same way, mine being the rational way and yours is the emotional way. But we are both defined by our thoughts and views on things. Orders between us don't go from top to bottom the struggle between us has always been unnecessary because without each other, we wouldn't perceive anything. And Papa also not, at least not through one of us and not the other, as we are two parts of a whole, one of Papa's infinite selves. We function in the same way. We've come to the end of a long journey which you would call an ego trip. We've been observing the world a long time from your point of view. There, clear logic didn't have a chance and I allowed everything to happen. I thought I was disabled. Sometimes there were headaches and I would have loved to stop thinking what I was made to think by your always having to be right and your understanding of logic I often got stomach aches. I have a suggestion. From now on we work together. I'll handle the logic and you the feelings and together we will create harmony. What do you think? Sounds like a plan brother. So how do we solve the tomorrow thing from your view? By thinking differently on another level. For a start, Samira is Tamara, just as she is you and all others in existence. Things happen on their own. This here too. Or did you have any control over the fact that Tamara entered our perception? Even running away wouldn't have changed anything as you saw her and reacted to her. Even if you ran, she would still be in here. You can't change anything because it happens on its own as all happens through the one, God, Papa. It's good that we just found a name for it or him. Nathan had to meet both Samira and Tamara, the same with all the others. We are Papa and nothing happens that isn't desired. Any objections that come, they are in other heads not in this one, are the logical result of different ways of thinking. They logically let you see different things the problem is that you identify yourself with my way of thinking, at least in those things that suit you in the moment. In other cases, you did the opposite. You opposed them, and therefore me, Jack, the Holy Spirit, that is found in every cell, even if I function differently for each one, just like an ego. It only happens in the human-like program cells where egos are creating their ego trips because they need them. It belongs to your development 
and I'm willing to bend myself for it. On the other hand, I would be very happy if it was over. To understand it, I'll give you an example on how to change your view on things. We are communicating through thought. I process things rationally and you emotionally, just as it should be. Instead of the nonsense, let's agree on something. Papa is experiencing itself through us. He gives us internal impulses, both of us. He is guiding you and me. All of us, Samira and Tamara too. We don't react emotionally anymore when confronted by a situation created by Papa. We rather show interest instead of crapping our pants from fear. Do you recognize this? That means that you must release the control the dogmans have over you, meaning allowing yourself to think what you can by just doing it. Can you understand the example? The logic behind it. The situation is as it is. You can interpret it in your own silly way and complain about your bad feelings. All you have to do is think differently. Not what you were thinking before. Can you do this? Give Tamara your full interest again instead of having stupid thoughts about which I can tell you that Samira does not find sexy at all, and who might herself benefit from what you learn from Tamara, as logically she would when you learn something now, maybe even consciously. Can you do it? Can we continue? Okay, fine, I answer, and concentrate again on the wonderful face of the woman in front of me, who had just stolen my senses and time, standing there with her hand stretched out towards me. I feel that I'm in a time lapse. So much is happening at the same time, and so much is happening in me each second, out there, but no one seems to notice. I'm amazed and see my attention being pulled back to Tamara, as if through a tunnel. Come. Let's go somewhere where we won't be disturbed, she invites me encouragingly. I take her hand and follow like a loyal dog. The only thing missing would be the panting. She takes me through a few streets, past houses and gardens full of vegetation, and I notice some strange things. On the doors, like a doorbell, there are objects that are half green and half red. I had also noticed one on the hood of Manuel's car. Only one colour was visible at once, though. They reminded me of something. We came to a house where it was green and she says, This one is free and I like the house. Let's go in. I follow her automatically and suddenly find myself in the kitchen. The scene changes like in a dream. She looks in a cupboard and takes a bowl out. Wait here. I'm quickly going to fetch something to eat and disappears. I look around, not really thinking anything, when suddenly a guy is standing in the door. Hi, can I help you? he asks. No thanks, I'm waiting for Tamara here, I answer. Don't know her, but uh, you know what you're doing. See you around. And he's gone. 
Know what I'm doing? Nope. No idea. Just observing. I'm here to experience it, to observe it, and not to judge it or find it strange. I would have done so earlier, Jack reminds me. But here and now, we are observing. Nothing else. When we don't know what to do, we know that Papa is asking us not to do anything. It's no use getting upset and asking what to do next, as it won't change anything about what's going to happen. Also, not the fact that through divine guidance, Tamara returns to the room and beams at me, the bowl full of fruit. I thought I'd just met a housemate of yours, but he didn't know you, it bursts out of me. Tamara looks at me with a bemused look, then laughs. I don't live here, but he's still my housemate. Let me explain. Today, no one has a fixed income. We are all free and move around freely and share our living space. The rules are simple. If a place is marked red, someone is asking for privacy. And they get it too. So you either wait for them to move out or you look for another place that's marked green. It's like the public toilets back then, as it is still so today. When you leave a place, you make sure it is as you would like to have found it. Food is everywhere around us and no one has to take out the trash as there hardly is any. It's become much easier. The best part is that no one has to pay rent anymore or spend decades paying off a house. There are, of course, more desired places, but it's on a first-come, first-served basis. And after a while, it becomes available again. The world has become much too interesting to spend your life in the same place. So you only have housemates regardless of who you see. So you're right in that respect, which also explains why he didn't know me. We're at home everywhere. It really is much different now. Here... Have something to eat. I take an apple and have a bite. A wave of pleasure washes over me. It still feels like an LSD trip. No more rent? No, no rent or anything else. The world and especially merchandise doesn't need money anymore. We just need little sliding hatches that show red or green. It couldn't be easier. Zero and one. Yours and mine. No one spends money now because no one needs to anymore. It's hardly used nowadays. I don't know anyone that does. Why should we if everything is freely available? Everyone does what they can to ensure that enough is available. It was the same earlier. Just today... We don't need any controlling bodies or elements that suck the energy, the money, into their own pockets. We used to work 8 to 10 hours a day for the system. Now we can be useful at any time by doing the things that you love doing and improving ourselves continuously. We don't have calendars anymore either. We don't meet at certain times anymore, but when we get an impulse to do so. You don't have to do anything else except follow your impulses. And I swear to you, you will meet everyone. Anybody you want to meet for as long as you want to. And it will always be the right person. Our beliefs and views didn't allow this earlier, but as usual it was always there. All directed by interest, just as we also met each other. Would you like to sit here in the kitchen or should we go to a room? Still chewing, I show her my apple core 
and she points through the door to the outside. The apple tree over there would enjoy a snack. Afterwards, you can follow me. I throw the core thankfully under the tree and follow her with anticipation. This woman has something to say and my feeling also tells me more than just that. We climb the stairs and look around. The passage leads to a few rooms and one of them has the door open and the marker on green. It's the bathroom. Two further rooms are marked red but a door is open and no one in it. It's occupied. They'll be coming back soon, says Jack. Three other doors are shut, but the markers are green. Tamara walks up to one, opens it and has a look inside, then looks over to me. How about this one? She says with a soft voice. I enter and look round. It's a beautifully decorated room with a dark red carpet, colourful pieces on the wall, a cupboard in a corner with two armchairs, a couch and a bookshelf. At the head of the room there is a bed standing on arm-thick tree trunks with the bark still on. Common property comes to mind, all available to be freely used. You just have to leave it as you would have liked to have found it. Tamara slides the marker over to Red and closes the door. She puts the fruit bowl down on the bed and I stand frozen in front of the bookshelf. It's a habit of mine. It doesn't matter where the bookshelf is. I always scan through it. I used to have a saying, show me your books and I'll tell you who you are. I've always read a lot in my life and I've always been very interested in books. On the shelf, one almost jumps at me. Between Kafka and Bukowski, I see a name that I know differently. Jesus, Urlauber, Bauke, and 2020. I take the book out of the shelf, and Tamara comes up to me. Hey! That's your story, isn't it? She asks with a knowing smile. Well, I answer. Bogie told me at breakfast this morning what I'm experiencing here and why everyone around me knows about it. He told me that I told him this story here and that he wrote the book about it. To see the book here in some shelf really flushed me. It's like a real dream, but I'm getting used to the fact that everything is a real dream and all is connected. Still, this well-used book is a surprise for me. You can really touch this dream. I know Bauchi very well, as well as your older self. We met each other through Eigeland. I was very excited as I knew he composed the anthem with Aiki. I had been an Aigilander for a while because it had changed my sense of self a lot and I was feeling very comfortable being one. You could compare it to a gamer guild. You can define a character with all possibilities, but belonging somewhere is always great. Most people get a lot from it. Belonging defines a certain way of thinking, but certainly not as dogmatic as before. Would you like to hear more? Then put the book back. You can read the story from here on, or carry on experiencing it. Yes, of course. We sit down on the bed, and I can feel a huge familiarity, like I was talking to my sister. I was a single mother back then. My daughter, Eva, was three years old in 2015. I was living with her and my then current boyfriend, Richard, who wasn't her father. I had always been a woman who enjoyed life and also sex. 
He always had a calming effect on me. I once thought I was a nymphomaniac, but then I realized that I was a mole. I just liked having sex. But in the world outside, it was always combined with freedom and bondage, reliance, expectations, and especially those who judged others because they were afraid to confront themselves. In the first half of 2015, something changed in me. I became very reflective as the relationship with Richard was becoming the next failed one. I can remember a letter I wrote to myself. Close your eyes and we'll try to synchronize with each other. Then you can also see it and we can read it together. At first I was confused and then I accepted her invitation and closed to them. Without opening your eyes, look at me, she says. Can you see me? I say yes out loud and she continues. See me sitting at a table with a stationery in front of me. I've just put the fountain pen away and am holding the page up so I can read it. Concentrate on the letter. Look at it through my eyes. It works like a charm. I see her letter clearly with my eyes. Can you read it? She asks. I concentrate on the words and start reading aloud, hesitantly at first, then with flow. Loneliness is always there. Sometimes you take it, sometimes it takes you. Now it has taken me, now it has taken me and before it can control me, I must take it back. I try to make sense of it. Maybe the only sense is that I am to be alone. What do you do when you're alone? Think. What do you think about yourself, about me? My first conclusion is that I'm unhappy. Why don't I do anything about it? If I want to be happy on my own, then I must be alone. Richard is always with me. We've spoken too much about our future, our love and our togetherness for me to just throw it away and go on my way. I don't want to leave him completely, just up to the point where I want to return by myself. But does he want it too? unnecessary ideas and questions. It will only resolve itself through actions. I still love him like before, but I want to be alone. Alone with Eva, but also alone with just myself. I'm not sure if I can be happy this way, or if it's possible with him too. It would be great, but hard to imagine. Am I a coward for blaming others if I'm not happy? There are lots of people who want to help, but the biggest help would be for me to decide who I am and what to do. That is the only thing I have to do. But it's so shitty. I'm writing that I must do it, and that I know it. But what is the real answer? I can see myself floundering around the place, looking for a rope, a grip. Does it help to know that the rope is me? To avoid falling even deeper, I say yes to life, to me. And because our love is so great, I also say yes to working on ourselves further. I talk to him as I do to myself, no lies and no masks. That's why there shouldn't be a problem except if I lie to myself, and therefore, to him. I want to study. I want to find my own home, stay together with him and reconcile with my mother. I want to make a long trip in the summer. I want to travel in February. I want 
to find myself. I want to be honest and I want to write. Now I'm feeling better, but not happier. As I stopped reading, her voice was still echoing. Unreal. The text became part of the book that you were holding. It and the letter can be found in many bookshelves. Many people could see themselves in it, and they were thankful for what I'll say next. Strike the last sentence. When I understood that I could never be happy as long as I kept telling myself so, that was my first conscious paradigm shift. I changed this thought habit by stopping myself thinking such things, as I could see it wasn't good for me. I wanted to be happy. Thought became reality. I learnt that from Rhonda Byrne's The Secret. I know that you ought to know the book. I ought to know about your opinion on the book. Namely how it can be dangerous for people looking for happiness because it doesn't tell you that everything they experience they wanted to experience and still did so unconsciously. We can see that clearly today as everything follows their own combined interests. Instead of wishing for something, I learnt to enjoy my life. Without the letter, it wouldn't have been possible though. At the end of August 2015, I happened upon your story and read it with growing interest and excitement. Then I found a letter in it. I still had it, so I took it out and compared it. It was an exact copy. How did Bauchi do it? It couldn't be true. I wasn't sure if I believed him that Nathan exists. That's why I'm so happy to have met you today even if I know Nathan well. This is a special moment for me too, and I've been waiting a long time for it. I knew I would be one of few people to meet you, the 2015 Nathan, in the world of 2020. It's all a game here. The last five years, no one knew if you existed or were just a fantasy of Vauhi and Nathan. However, he had dictated my letter. Comment from the author. That could be because Nathan showed it to me today as Tamara showed him, except that Nathan is a few thousand kilometers away, and I really did type it word for word. I was naturally curious and researched who this Bauchi was, and what he otherwise did apart from making bestsellers from the stories of his friends, helping not only me to find a joy in life again. So I came across Eigeland and found the insight that I was right in my letter, and it was all true. Also, still, that I hadn't done any of it. Richard and I were still living together, loving each other, but simply couldn't manage alone. So I made a decision, or rather, it made itself. It was really an insight. With a heavy heart and lots of nervousness, I left him and told him what I had read in a text from Bauchi, that it was a different sort of separation. You can look for it yourself if you like. The important thing is that I got the chance to give myself freedom using objective arguments, freedom, that I thought he'd taken from me somehow. I called my mother, who was happy to hear from me, even if our relationship was never anything special. I thanked her for her love and told her I had to find myself again. She asked about Eva, and I told her I was taking her with me. She told me that if it was too stressful for her, she could gladly come to her. She had been really lonely lately, which is why I didn't visit her anymore, because she always pressured me and pushed the feel-bad button, which I simply overheard during this phone call. 
and she would be glad to watch Eva for a while. She too had been thinking about things in the first few months of the year and realised that many of my problems came from her not letting me do my own thing as she always stuck her nose into my business. Her offer was a concession and when I asked Eva what she thought about living with her for a while, she was very excited. For the first time in my life I was free. I knew exactly what I wanted to experience. This story, your story, which is also your own, which you shared with us through Bauchi. For many it was a divine sign that they had been waiting for a long time. For me too. So I set sail. A backpack full of clothes, my camera and my laptop were all I had. When I left my home with Richard, it came differently than I had expected. He had also read the book. Let's go our own ways, stay in contact and with love allow the other to experience whatever they want on their journeys so that each one is happy Instead of standing in each other's ways, he said. I love you and all that you think, do or say is okay for me. I don't have to find everything that you do great and I also don't have to know everything. But I'm always here for you. Contact me, you know how to. Tomorrow I'm packing my things too and leaving. Let's explain. Experience this adventure. I stood there dumbfounded and broke it in tears. He took me into his arms and we both cried. Not out of sadness as it was over and we had loved each other so much, but because we loved each other and had, at last, found a way to make a fresh start. It was like being reborn. I stayed the night and we made love until early morning. It was different. It felt so free. Free from expectations, free from interpretations, free of thoughts, of fear of loss and free of norms. Everything flowed and it was flowing through us. We were one and we knew that our journey tomorrow would start together, even if in different directions. As the sun rose, he looked me in the eyes and said, You are a love artist. If someday you are wondering how you can help, then concentrate on that. I couldn't believe it. Everything that was happening was written in 2020, in a more rudimentary form, but with clear words. Not much about the details, but everything necessary to understand the construct. In the next part, there was something about Eigenland that I had said to myself, although it was my five years older self. Eigi, aka Thomas, was the first person I visited, as I had found him on workcarte.de. It was an Easter egg hidden in a sentence of the book, and when I registered... I saw how many people were already there so that they could later meet in person. It was great, and a week later I was with him. I was hoping to meet Bauchi, but he was on the road throughout Germany to promote the book. I did meet him later, though. Eigi got the message through to me that I had a talent. My sexuality wasn't anything perverted, and I wasn't abnormal just because I liked sex and liked having different partners. He 
just laughed when I told him that I enjoy doing something good for a man by sleeping with him and that I had my fun too. He told me, in Eigenland, women like you are very much respected. The sexual energy is the highest in the physical realm. If you are generous with it, then the logical result is that many men are drawn to you. However, don't let that feed your ego. Just realize that it's a talent. Not many women can be so open in the society to be as they want to be and still accepted for who they are. In Ireland, we can, as we respect each other. No other woman is jealous of you or would call you a slut. They too can be helped by you or can learn from you. That really knocked me off my feet. He wasn't judging me or implying that I work as a prostitute. He was inviting me to accept myself as I was and make the best out of it. I love that about Heigeland. This philosophy is being lived and no other country in the world was formed around the fact that people are equal, living, and they still are. It is written in the other constitutions and is constantly being quoted, but it's never been lived. It's just not possible in a hierarchy because you have to fit in somewhere. There's no hierarchy in Eigeland. Everyone is their own king and others are left in peace and all help each other. There would never be war in Eigeland as none of the inhabitants are opponents. Eigenland is a part of the Terra Nia network, one of many these days. Terra Nia means our Earth. It belongs to all. Today you can't even logically explain to our children what wolves are. They just don't understand. It doesn't fit into their way of thinking. Everything is Ubuntu. We now see that all these countries are nothing more than constructs of the mind. No one seriously defines themselves through them anymore. The earth became a playing field once the slaughtering stopped. A lot has changed. She falls into deep silence, deep in thought. Then she continues. After the night with Richard, something was different too. We ate breakfast almost without a word. And even though we hadn't slept the whole night, we were fit and ready to leave. We just smiled at each other the whole time. It all felt good. The sex was different too. And from then on, my sex stayed different. Just like it was that night. So easy and uncomplicated. I slowly understood what sex is. A synergy of energies in exchange. It needs energies that balance each other. Love works just like hate and without sex there would be no wars as they are the pinnacle of hate. In the coming times love was to be elevated to that which you can see here today. It's happening the whole time and all over. Similar energies are drawn together and when they meet and can move around freely, they build each other up and virtually explode. Hate had reached its peak as the resources were limited and it was destructive sex. But love can continue endlessly because it gives life and makes anything possible. That's why sex was a topic for so many back then, especially problem-bound sex. Since no one could move freely, there was no room to expand. When it all changed, our sexuality also changed along and things quickly became different for almost everyone. 
2015 was a year of great change and 2016 was the year that freedom came for all through us. Everyone could see what was happening and it wasn't a mystery but simple logic. If we all prohibit each other from everything, then we can't experience anything. It's as easy as that. When the people stopped prohibiting everything around them and stopped following the prohibitions, life quickly became very experimental. That opened many doors to new worlds. You'll have your first sex sex with Samira. I would really like to have it with you, but I don't want to take away your fun and motivation when you return to 2015 and get to find it out for yourself. We'll still be having our fun too, as my memory serves me. We'll find each other and are always connected. You just have to think of me and I'll be there. She lays her hand on my chest and takes a deep breath without breaking our eye contact. A huge wave of gratitude, joy and unconditional love for this woman flows through me. No more words are necessary and I lean over and hug her. She returns the hug and draws herself closer to me. Another wave of energy flows through me that she had unlocked earlier with her kiss. Again, I get the feeling that time has stopped. That is sex, she leans over and whispers. It has nothing to do with screwing, but screwing on the basis of sex. You'll love it. What about Richard? I ask. Yes, I am his woman, she answers. We didn't see each other for almost a year, but remained in contact through WhatsApp. One day something ignited in me, and I wanted to see him. It was the same for him. When we met again, it was as I'd wished. With heads held high, we stood in front of each other. Two independent people that didn't need anything from each other but were enjoying each other we spent a few great weeks together then went our separate ways again still connected through our hearts we knew the other and their unconditional love and we could love them and ourselves just as we were since then it hasn't changed we see each other then each does their own thing it all freely follows our interests. It's like that for most people these days. He's in Australia with Eva at the moment. She really wanted to spend some time in the outback. We hold each other a while longer. Then I notice something igniting in me. I want to see Samira. As if she was reading my thoughts. Which she was, as we are one conscious in this moment and celebrating it, she separates herself from me and looks deep into my eyes. Well then, time traveller, you know how it works. Just follow your impulses. It will guide you to her. Say hi to her from me. I am her sister. Go on, I'll fix up the room. It was great to share this experience with you. We'll see each other at the end of 2015. We laugh and I give her a kiss. Thank you. Thanks for everything, I say. Then get up and leave. On the way out, I glance at the book, but don't want to pick it up again. I don't want to spoil my fun in finding out what will happen next. I step out onto the street and from Papa's view, see Nathan doing it. Jack next to him, and Jack next to me. The Trinity wonders at the beauty all around. I follow my instincts and greet everyone that I meet heartily. 
They all greet back and each time a wave of love flows through me. I somehow walk the route back that Tamara brought me on and land at Café Olé again. I can hear laughter from a distance and as I get there, I see all my friends sitting there. Bauhi, Christina, Mark and a woman that I don't yet know, who I assume to be Natalie, Nathan and next to him, my heart jumps, Samira. They happily greet me as they see me, like they were waiting for me. They are here as they knew the book and that I would be coming by. Samira pulls up a chair next to her and invites me to sit. For once, I want to sit between you two, she laughs. That doesn't happen every day, sitting between my beloveds. Nathan smiles at me. Back then, I was sitting in your chair. Today, I'm sitting on this one. Let's enjoy a few minutes before Samira takes you on a trip, where for us, you won't return from. We're all very glad you're here, and it means a lot to us. To be honest, we all met on the island a week ago, so we would be here when you came. After you arrived, we all knew you would pitch up in Café Olé. Tamara informed us that it was time when you two left. By the way, this is Natalie. We greet each other with loving glances. Stefan and William send their regards. They are on an excursion at the beach. We didn't want to miss out on saying goodbye to you. I wanted to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your story that you've shared with us, which has become a part of all of our stories. It sounds a bit egomaniacal if I say it, but I'm saying explicitly to you that you are the one that will do it. You are the guy I was five years ago, that I'm not today anymore. Still, we are one. Don't ever forget it. That was the most important thing I took back from my trip. I would now like to take a deep breath with you, because through you, the world learnt it. The path to inner peace. Do you all want to join in? He asks the others. We all hold hands, partly or completely close our eyes and breathe in together and then breathe out. As I open my eyes, I see that everything is good. A lust for life overcomes me and I must think of the Mary book again. It's all so indescribably beautiful. Who owns the cafe, I ask, as I notice there are no waiters. The others laugh. No one, and everyone, answers Natalie. There are a few restaurants where certain cooks still work, which we visit because they've made a name for themselves. However, the guests work with them. Whatever has to be done, we do ourselves. We serve ourselves, wash up, clean and bring specialties with us if we have some. And we share everything. It seems strange, doesn't it? But it's so easy. No one has to do anything they don't want to. But it's still all being done anyway. Mostly with fun and joy as you are always there with friends. I don't have any more questions, except one. Is there anything you would like to share with the people of 2015 when Belki and I write the book? Yes, lots of love. We believe in you. They all choir in. My heart is overflowing with love and tears of joy and emotion flow. So much love. Samira gives Nathan a kiss, then takes my hand. 
How about a walk? She asks. And somehow, everything dissolves. I nod and we stand up and say goodbye to everyone with loving hugs. I've never seen so much love in one place in my life. I feel joy, courage, excitement, anticipation and countless other positive feelings growing in me and flowing through me in a huge wave. I'm almost dizzy from it. As Samira and I step out onto the street, we run into Tamara, Manuel and Mojo. They also want to say goodbye. Tamara and Samira cuddle each other and giggle. Then Samira takes my hand again and we walk down the street towards a car that's marked green. We take it and she drives. We leave the city to the north. It feels like a film to me. An interactive film or game where a video sequence is running and I don't have to do anything but watch what is happening. I can feel Papa behind me, to the right, and Jack next to him. He's also sitting there, just next to the car. We smile at each other and enjoy the harmony. Samira sits quietly beside me, smiling and driving the car. It's so wonderful to be with you, I say. I feel so at peace, so here and so accepted as I am. She looks me directly in the eyes and it hits me like a bolt. My God, this woman is stunning. I feel I'm one with her, like I've never felt before. The wonderful thing is that you're with yourself. That is the reason you can perceive me free from expectations or fears. I feel the same. Such togetherness is truly an enrichment. That's why I love you more than anyone else. You're special to me because we fit. We complement each other perfectly because we are free from everything else. If we had met a few years earlier, we wouldn't have been able to. How did we meet? I mean, our younger you and me. Are you sure you want to hear the answer now? She asks mischievously. Mm, I don't think so, I admit. But I'm so excited and want to see you soon again. You will, but can you see how you're not in the here and now anymore? Your thoughts are wandering and you're not concentrating anymore. It's not serious, but also not beneficial for you. I can see it and look at Jack with wonder. Don't look at me. At your programming, he answers. Then I see how my thoughts were following my fear. I fear that this moment will pass, that I will wake up somewhere without any memory and never see Samira again. A really crappy feeling, and it's spoiling this moment where she's really sitting next to me. The next program pops up and gives me nice sentences like, you idiot, can't you do anything? I can see how Jack is thinking them, but I also see how he has no choice but to think them because my views, and all my fears are such views, determine what 
you will think. Oh, I'm thankful in this moment that I'm even able to see what's happening in me. That alone gives me clarity. And I, my ego, Nathan, says, just carry on watching. Experience. And I'm immediately back in the here and now. And I look over to Samira and thank her for her direct words. No problem, she answers. I learnt that from you. She smiles at me and turns a corner into a street that I recognise. It's the street where the cute little house with the Tesla tower is, the one that leads to the beach. Do we really just drive 20 kilometres together? So quickly? I ask the question aloud because a black hole appears on my screen. There, you can again see how relative time is, she answers laughing. Anyway, we're here now and there are a few others in the house. I would like to drive to the beach and spend some time alone with you. I don't have any objections. She parks the car in front of the parking lot and we get out. This isn't a parking lot anymore. It wouldn't make sense as hardly anyone comes here with a car anymore, she explains as we walk towards the beach. Sometimes a couple of people gather here and sit together, play music, have a barbecue, or go for a swim. If they do come by car, they park it at the house. That's your doing, by the way. You were the one who started fixing it up. We didn't know each other then, and it was one of the first things you did after your return. Even as Bauchi was still writing the book, you came here and saved the house, guided by the IHR, the Intergalactic Help and Rescue Team. Unused living space was saved from decay without claiming ownership, but through living and usage, It was restored and new life breathed into it. It didn't take long and you weren't alone anymore. You went on a sailing trip with Thomas for a while. I listened with fascination and we came to the beach which was empty. She took a few things from her bag, among them my towel. Nathan gave this to me. You left it in the finca when you went for your walk this afternoon. Normally, you leave everything where it is, and it spreads itself around by itself. But in this special case, his opinion was that it belonged to your things. I take it with surprise. This afternoon? Only now do I realise that I've only spent 30 hours in the year 2020, and I've probably slept ten of those. Time is relative. I take the towel, which still looks and feels like a normal towel, and lay it down on the place I was lying earlier. It all started here, I say devoutly. She takes my arm and draws me towards the water. Come, let's cool down a bit. I follow her into the sea, which feels more wonderful than I've ever felt. Every pore can feel the cool, salty wetness and every cell celebrates when I'm in completely. Samira draws me to herself, looks me in the eyes and kisses me. I just melt and notice how we are one with each other. Her touch It's electrifying. My body starts to shake and I just let it happen. We become the pure energy that we are. Nothing else exists as everyone is made from this energy. The water around us is a part of us. The island, the whole earth and the universe. There is nothing else except this energy from which everything that can ever be experienced comes. 
we explode with love, literally, we both orgasm at the same time. It flows through our bodies in waves, caused by S-E-X and simple touches. We moan and scream our pleasure out loud. And then we have a fit of uncontrollable laughter. The ground is still under our feet, but we feel like we're flying. We love each other, ourselves, the others, and everything around us infinitely beyond any words that can be used to describe it. You just can't describe it. You can only experience it. And we were experiencing it. After a while, we head back to the beach. I fall onto my towel and she lies down beside me. In love, we look at each other and start laughing again. Life is good, I can hear Stefan's words in me. You must never forget it. Yes, little brother, how right you are. How could I ever forget it? Thank you for your reminder. I really, really, really needed it. I won't ever forget again. After a period of silence, Samira starts talking again. It might sound unfair if I tell you some things and not others, but you know why. That which I'm going to tell you, I want to share with you, as it affects us both. I won't tell you where and when we met in the other world, but I would like to explain how it was for me. It will also help to keep you in the here and now, even if you are about to return to 2015 and back again. I wasn't really happy. Life was shitty and I experienced one letdown after the other. It was different from my sister Tamara, who in my eyes was whoring around and jumping into bed with anyone she could, even though she had a daughter and boyfriend with whom she was living together. Even though I loved the little Eva more than anything, I saw an extreme opposite in Tamara, and I hated her because I couldn't approach men as she could. I had too many doubts about myself. I was jealous of her and I buried myself in self-loathing and withdrew. One day, she came to me. She was crying and talking about some nonsense that I didn't understand. She gave me a book and said, Read it. It will help us all. Aunt, I love you too. It was your book, or Bauchis, whatever with your story. After she left, I was bored, so I took it and started reading, silently. I liked that in the first few pages I read about a beautiful and apparently lovable woman with my name, so I read further. I then realised that certain projects and names weren't imagined, but could all be found on the internet. I had known about Andre Stern and Birkin Beale and Jeff Lawton was the first name I entered into the Google search and then I was hooked. With the knowledge that there was truth to the story written there, I read the whole thing in one go. I couldn't stop reading. When I read Tamara's story, I had a longing and hope, not only for the world, but for myself. I really hoped that I was the Samira in the book. And somehow, it felt like it too. Things changed in me. I knew that I didn't have to do anything but accept the invitations in the book to become part of its story and to find you. I felt that you were also looking for me too. At least I hoped so. I started listening to the Okie Talk shows, giving the book away, advertising it and communicating with others. I met more and more people who were suddenly living in joy. I crawled out of my shell and became open and approachable 
and life was more fun every day. Then one day at, oops, almost said it, you were there too. No one knew who you were, as Belgi had always kept your cover, but I knew exactly who you were. I could see it in your eyes, boundless joy that you were considerately and somewhat uncertainly trying to hide. I could see that you had something that you've been waiting on a long time from which your eyes couldn't leave. Me. My heart was pumping and it felt like the world was dissolving. We approached each other and fell into each other's arms. I'm Nathan, you said. And I answered, I know. We looked into each other's eyes and kissed each other. And from then on, everything was different. I was a completely new person. Independent, upright and honest. As much as I could be. I had become a butterfly after being a caterpillar for so long. Since then, I was your woman. And am deeply honoured that you call yourself my man. No further pledges were necessary for the relationship. Our love is unbreakable, even if we don't see each other that often. You have your life and I have mine, which is normal these days. But when we meet each other in the flesh, we laugh and enjoy it to the fullest. I feel healed as I am complete and because you are there always here in my heart. When I became captivated by on mind gaming because I saw what was possible, I became better at perceiving you in myself and could communicate with you any time. We do so many times a day without yearning, without fear of loss but with unconditional love and appreciation. From this unconditional love, I'm asking you something important. Until we see each other again, I wish that you use every chance to be happy. Whatever you need for that is okay with me. To put it another way, I want you to do everything possible to be happy so that I can experience you as that. Happy. That includes other women. I know that in 2015 it's not as common. So that's why I'm telling you explicitly if you get the chance to have fun with another woman in bed too then I want you to do so. If you don't and say, I'm the cause, then it will be very uncomfortable for me. I want to be an enrichment in your life, not a limitation. More and more are realizing it. The rivalry thinking will disappear in this way, and sexuality will be freed from the prisons of religions and their views. This is also the way that people will stop deceiving cheating and being unfaithful because it simply isn't possible anymore. Instead, there is a growing measure of openness which most won't have dreamed possible. When you return, you should watch a film. It's a soft porn from the 70s with Sylvia Christel, Emmanuel II. Incredibly kitschy though, forget the playing on screen, or play with yourself if you like, but pay attention to the following. See the relationship the two have, how open and loving it is, and listen to what her man tells his friend when they are standing on the veranda, where he explains how they feel about each other. I'm grateful for these words at the end of the book because not only have I learnt to see Tamara differently but I've opened myself 
to this form of partnership that we're living. Emmanuel and her man were living it in the film. And today, we're all doing it. It didn't only help me with my problems about sexuality. Through your story, the film became popular again and became an example for a whole generation of people, especially the younger ones who had their problems with the ideas of the older people, were able to apply this way of living as it was much easier for them to find themselves. Here's another tip for you, this time about your teeth. Look for Russian healing methods. The names Grobovoy and Petrov will stick out. Do your research. They have already learned through online gaming how to regrow and heal organs. Teeth too. Research everything you've learned here. It can all be found in 2015. Nothing really new has been invented since then. We just started using that which was there already. I would like to say something else if I may. Tamara, if you're reading this here, please know that I love you with all my heart. You have become an example for me. I couldn't help fighting with you because I love you so much. I just didn't love myself enough to be able to love others properly. Not even you. You are the best sister imaginable and are perfect as are all the others too. Please forgive me for not seeing it. Please tell me to read the book. Tell everyone they must read it and then it will become true. The manuscript can be downloaded for free. Do you still have questions? Yes, I do. Thousands of them. But especially one that I'm afraid to ask. But she's looking at me so lovingly, as if she knew what was going on inside me. So I overcome my fear. Would you like to sleep with me? Sex, sex. More than ever. Here, I'll deflower you, just like you did with me five years ago. I ask you to keep the same promise that I gave you five years ago. Carry the energy out into the world. When we're physically apart and an opportunity arises, please, please use it. If you hadn't done so, you wouldn't have been so practiced for my first time, just like I am now through my experiences, and it wouldn't have been so unbelievably nice for me. It's something completely personal between you and me, and what the rest of the world does isn't important. Agreed? I nod in agreement and get the feeling that anything else wouldn't matter anyways. She asks me to sit up and looks me in the eye and softly starts stroking me. I get goosebumps all over and lose myself in her gaze. I hear her guiding me to just let it flow and enjoy what was to come without doing anything but to follow my impulses. She pushes me backward onto the ground and pulls my bathing costume down, which I've been wearing since yesterday. Physically, things become X-rated. Internally, I become one with all again. My consciousness expands with hers and I can feel the whole world and universe in me. What Samira does to me is none of your business. Try it and find out for yourselves. Have your own experiences. I feel orgasms and ecstasy beyond all thought. I feel joy in life 
and an unbound urge. I can feel it coming from Papa and as Papa, I can see what is to be done next. I can see all the cells from all times and all possible stories in me. And I see Nathan lying on his towel in 2015. In the beginning where he felt, understandably, completely helpless in another time, I can feel him in the here and now, traveling consciously back to 2015. Carefully, I approach the all-encompassing consciousness of Nathan 2015 and return to myself and into him. I open my eyes and blink. Samira isn't there anymore, just in me. And I reach for my water bottle, open it and take a drink. It tastes great. And as I sit up, I enjoy the view of the rubbish bins. Enjoy it, says Jack to my right. They won't be there much longer. I hear the voices of the people around me and those of my friends. For the first time in my life, I get the feeling of knowing exactly what to do next. My life now has an obvious meaning this here might be the first book where at the end the story doesn't finish, but rather starts. I want to experience these things and there is only one way there. I must do what I can to spread it around and must follow all the invitations I get to build a new earth. Who wants to help?